button on yeah. the right there. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. That's yeah. it. Okay. That's oh. it. Just press it once and then it starts Easier. to talk. And, and then, then the only thing to remember is press it off again, off again. afterwards. Yes. Good morning, yeah. Councillor Ladd. So is this morning. morning. Off. So you just press it once and then you talk. Yeah. And then when you finish. Hi, right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, just on 10 o'clock, so we'll make a start. Uh, I'm just thinking it's like facing a court of inquiry sitting here, I think, with, with you lot around here. So. Um, okay, so my name's Councillor Michael Ladd. I'm the chairman of uh, uh, Scrutiny Committee. Um, members of the public and press may record, film and photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded and in line with the council's published guidance. Please could I encourage you to turn off your IT equipment uh, or put it on silent, please. Can I remind you to speak clearly into microphones and avoid placing things like papers and IT equipment in front of the microphones. This will affect the sound quality, particularly on the live broadcast, and we are live at the moment. Uh, we're not expecting a fire drill today, but uh, I'm sure you know what to do if you hear the alarms go off. Okay, uh, item one on the agenda is the public questions and we have no applications to speak this morning. Item two is apologies for absence and any substitutions. We have apologies from the uh, vice chairman, Councillor Sarah Adams, but unfortunately she could not find a substitute. Item three is declarations of interest and dispensations. Are there any? No, nope, thank you. Item four then is minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 13th of July. Are you content to agree these minutes? Yep, thank you. And we go into the substantive uh, item this morning, which is the recruitment and retention of care workers. Now you may remember this, uh, elements of this came out of our workshop we held at the end of September. And just to remind councillors, you've obviously got all the papers, but the objective of this meeting is to provide members with the opportunity to consider how the council works with independent care providers, uh, and we have a representative here this morning from the care, independent care providers, to help them address the issue of recruitment and retention of care staff, with the aim of securing the quality and sustainability of the care market in Suffolk, and also how it addresses the issue as an employer of care staff through its home first service. Uh, very topical, I think, probably this is at the moment. We've seen quite a lot in the press 
uh, about this particular issue. So, it's really uh, concentrating on recruitment and retention of staff, as I said, and not the wider aspects of care provision. So, welcome uh, this morning to uh, Councillor Hoffensberger, uh, Georgia, Claire, and uh, Prima. I think Michael, Michael, sorry, yes, it's in the back, but I couldn't quite see you, but, but you're there as well. So, well, I'll let them introduce themselves, and I think, uh, Rebecca, you're going to, uh, sorry, I called you Rebecca, didn't I? So, um, and you're going you're gonna to kick off. So if you can just introduce yourselves first, and then, Becky, you can, you can kick us off. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. I think everyone knows me, but I'm Becky Hopfensberg. I haven't remember, I don't care. Good morning. I'm Georgia Chimbani, um, Director for Adult and Community Services. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Claire Smith. I'm Assistant Director for Service Development and Contracts, so I have the accountability for the care market. I'm Prima fairburn Dory, and I'm a, a Director of Primary Home Care, but I'm also the Chair of the Suffolk Association of Independent Care Providers. Morning all, I'm Michael Howe, I'm the HR lead for Adult Services and, and Children's Services at the Council. Nice to meet you all. Okay, thank you for that. I think, Georgia, we didn't quite, you are a bit quiet. I think it's because you've got your laptop in front of your microphone. Just, yes, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Becky. Thanks, Michael. Um, morning, everyone. So I'm just going to give a very brief introduction and um, then I'll hand over to Georgia and Claire for the, um, the main presentation. Um, it's been well exercised that we know that and publicised that we know social care is faced with many challenges, not least we're still um, catching up and, um, and suffering from some of the consequences and the impacts of COVID and the pandemic that had on the sector um, and particularly um, the difficulty in recruitment and retention is what we're looking at today. This is um, putting a huge amount of pressure on um, the sector as a whole, the increasing background of difficulty with regards to um, the cost of living for individuals um, and the increasing costs, energy costs, petrol prices, and all the costs that are involved with running a business um, is all on top of an already very stretched market with regards to recruitment and retention. Um, a lot of it is because um, people are just burnt out so they are leaving the, the profession but also trying to attract people into social care is also very difficult which is why one of the reasons we started our eye care social care campaign was to try and raise the profile to show what a rewarding job social care can be. Um, it has had particularly over um, the COVID pandemic, whilst we clapped for our carers, some of the care homes, there was had quite a lot of negative publicity around there, which um, doesn't attract, necessarily attract new people coming into the system. So we have all that on top of an already increasingly um, difficult economic background which we, with which we are working in. Um, and I think now be appropriate to once again thank the social care sector for all they do in the front line and all they are doing because um, without them we wouldn't all be here today and the support that they give um, they go above and beyond um, in very difficult circumstances which you will um, I'm sure Preem will be touching on um, as part of the presentation. Um, and I think with regards to the social care market itself it is actually a really complex um, a set of providers we've got. We have a lot of small to medium sized sort of, um, businesses in Suffolk. So therefore, it doesn't take a lot for the businesses to either to tip into a, a crisis or a difficult, in difficulties with regards to the size of their businesses. And um, ha ha trying to keep that as a stable market is very difficult. Um, not given, and it's not special. It's not special to Suffolk, but it's a national context. But Suffolk, in particular, um, has a lot of small to medium-sized businesses, which means that the and the stability of the market can tend to be very volatile. 
Um, we at Suffolk County Council do what we can with regards to helping stabilise the market. Our home first in-house care providers are actually not only our re-enablement team, so they are the people that would go out when you get the six weeks after you are discharged from hospital, they will go out and help re-enable you in order to you, for you to get back on your feet um, or um, to get to the next part of your um, care journey. Um, they also act as a, what we call a pride of last resort. So where we have difficulty in picking up care within the market itself, Home First will actually step in and help pick up that care to again, um, to ensure that people will receive the care and support they need. So that's um, one of our ways in which we, are tr we try to stabilize the market in very difficult times. Um, what's important to also highlight is that whilst we do commission over 500 um, independent businesses with regards to um, our supporting our um, residents with care, um, we do not run their businesses for them. They are all individual businesses. So therefore, um, with regards to pay and conditions, it is down to those independent businesses to set their standards of how they want to pay and um, how they um, and, and the conditions within the, within they work. We will commission. Um, we have a, we commission people with regards to quality of care, and there is a contract we have with them. But we um, are not there to tell people how to run their businesses. We work very closely with our providers, um, but it's up to them with regards to how they um, pay and the paying conditions for their staff and the contracts they have with their staff. Um, what we do have, though, is we have a very we have a contract support team, which supports our um, providers, and they are there at the end of the phone um, to ask any questions. Particularly, it's particularly important for us to have that st strong contact between us and the providers over the changing guidance during the COVID pandemic. It provided we provided really key help to allow people to navigate through try to navigate through the changing guidance, which was often on a daily basis and sometimes very scant with regards to detail. So we were able to, to um, help providers in supporting them in able to um, carry out their obligations under new guideline guidance with regards to um, um, any COVID um, infection control and things like that. So we have a very close relationship with our providers and support them. But we don't only support them through giving advice and support. We also do um, support them financially as well. Um, we supported them um, by um, infection control grants and various grants during the pandemic. Um, we also this year recognised the, the extra pressure that our providers have with regards to cost of living and rising costs in running businesses and attracting people. So we have actually this year um, which Claire will give some more information to, given an in-year uplift, inflationary uplift with regards to the fees that we pay our carers, um, our care providers. So we will give you some more information on that during the presentation. Um, I, I refer to one, one of the other ways that we support our providers. As I said, I refer to the I Care Support um, campaign that we have, the social care campaign that we have. We, um, this is to raise the profile of social care. Um, it's not always seen as a very glamorous way um, to, to um, vocation in life. It's, um, and, and as I said, during the pandemic, there was a lot of negative um, publicity, especially over care homes with regards to um, COVID. And um, we really just want to um, show people what a rewarding career it, can, it is. Um, how you are valid, and it's not just you're not just looking after people. There are ways in which you can gain skills, or way you can have career progression. That's really important to us because a lot of people see it as a, 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 a not a dead end job, but a, but sort of a job which they can't see any career progression in. And they just see it as a sort of just one one thing you can do, look after people, which in itself is very rewarding. We want to show that there are ways in which you can gain skills, you can get, have a vocational career out of um, being in social care rather um, than some of the negative um, connotations that might come with working on a front, in a frontline services like that. Um, 
And, and I think what's, what's really helped us, and I think, um, and also our, uh, again, it helps with showing um, what an innovative way um, social care, working in social care can be, is also the introdu introduction of our Cassius program, which is our digital care program. Having that um, as a tool for people working in social care to use, um, in we are ahead of the game with regards to providing digital care, and I th and I see that as a real attraction for people working in social care and um, using the digital care as a complement to the face-to-face -face care, and it shows that we are moving forward. We're in we're innovative in Suffolk, and it's an attractive place to to work and go forward. So. Um, I think that's all in regards to a um, introduction. I'll pass over to George with regards to the actual uh, presentation itself. Thank you very much. So there's four um, areas um, that you asked us to address today. Um, first one is around the responsibilities that the County Council has in supporting recruitment and retention of staff directly involved in uh, providing care and support. Um, second is around current staff vacancy and turnover rates in Suffolk and how these, uh, how these are changing and how they compare to other areas of the country. Um, the main I in issues that are impacting or influencing the recruitment and retention of staff um, and the last was what we're doing in Suffolk to address the issues of staff recruitment and retention, and of course our role as a county council in this. Um, in a sense, to answer um, question one in terms of our responsibilities, um, I thought the best place to start was to actually start with our statutory responsibilities. So under the, uh, the, the, under the, under the CARE Act 2014, um, there's a very clear provision and expectation in terms of our duty as a local authority. So we're expected as a local authority to promote diversity and quality in the provision of services. And what that means is we must absolutely make sure that we promote an efficient and effective care market that actually meets the care and support needs of people who, who require care and support. We also need to ensure that there's a variety of providers um, to provide a variety of services to make sure that people's varying needs are met um, and that people have sufficient information to be able to make an informed decision about how, to, to, how their needs will, will be met. Um, additionally, we also have a duty as a local authority to ensure that um, we've got sufficient information at our disposal as a local authority um, on the providers of services in our area, so the type of services they provide. We also need to make sure that we are aware of current and future demand um, of such services. We have a statutory duty also around enabling adults with needs for care and support, and carers of course, to be able to participate in work, education or training. Um, and in ensuring the sustainability of the market is really, really important. So we do have a role as a local authority to ensure that we try as much as we can to make sure there's a sustainable care market. Um, and of course, hand in hand with that is the importance of continuous improvement in quality of their services um, and of course fostering a workforce um, to ensure that people have the right skills um, and uh, working conditions. So that's our responsibilities under the CARE Act. Um, how we deliver those as a local authority will vary slightly from local authority to local authority, but um, we have a number of ways in which we do this. Claire will, will give detail later on in the presentation in terms of some of the things we're doing to meet our statutory responsibilities. But one of the ways we also do this is our care market and sustainability strategy. So we have a care market and uh, a care and support uh, sustainability strategy, which very clearly um, identifies gaps in service provision. It talks about um, current and future demand what we think we will need in coming years, and this is particularly helpful to providers such as Prima in terms of being able to adapt their business model um, based on the changing needs of the uh, population of Suffolk. 
Uh, we also work hand in hand with the Care Quality Commission. They have a statutory responsibility to ensure that all registered services um, provide care, uh, offer a certain a, a good, quality, good quality care, um, and they undertake regular inspections, and we work hand in hand with the Care Quality Commission to be able to deliver on our Care Act responsibilities. We also um, do some work uh, with um, ADAS, which is the Association of Directors of uh, social services and what you see on, in the, on the slide in front of you now is on the left hand side is information that's collected by ADAS East, uh, East of England region um, in terms of um, the number of providers in the different local authorities who are uh, rated good or outstanding by the Care Quality Commission. And as you can see, we are at the top of that, which is something we're incredibly proud of uh, in Suffolk, because I think this is testament to um, the providers that we work with and how well we work together to support each other to ensure that we deliver good quality care. You'll notice that the national average is about a 72.77%, um, and actually in terms of East of England, we're at the top in terms of 82.3. We then on the right-hand side also then have uh, a similar comparison from the CQC, um, and that includes an, an nationally, we're, at, at, we're third, um, 82.32. Uh, so again, um, well above the national average, which if I can see from here, 72 against the 72.77. So that's something we're incredibly proud of. Um, if I hand over to Claire, and Claire will take us to, through, do you want me to click for you, or you click for you? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> technical error. <laughs> this is our recruitment and retention position in Suffolk, and um, we've just Put it, it's all in the report, but we just put it in um, diagrammatic form for you. Um, and so you can see we have got a very high turnover rate in the market. We've also got a um, high vacancy rate. The map on the, 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 of England gives you the regional averages. And so you can see Suffolk isn't um, that different with the eastern region, which is all the, the authorities in our area. Whereas the further north you go, the, the vacancy rates do drop. Um, and then what we've also put on the, in the block graph is the home first. So this is our in-house reablement service, um, Becky referred to. And the vacancy rate there, or the turnover rate, sorry, we've worked, they've worked incredibly hard to try and get that down. And that has reduced over the last um, two years. So what are the pressures we've got with recruitment and retention? So, you know, we can't get away from it. Staff wages are uncompetitive. And it's a very competitive environment at the moment. Uh, the cost of living, inflation pressures have made this even worse. So obviously carers will leave because they need to find um, higher wages. Um, staff working in services such as home care and um, they're very dependent on travel costs so that's also had an impact with the fuel increase because there's 500 um, providers some have got good career progression others not so much because you have to change um, employer and it's not always obvious it's not always clear which where, where to go if you want to progress your career so that makes it difficult sometimes for new people coming into the, if they want to progress a career, they may think, well, maybe care's not for me because I can't see a good route through it. Um, Becky alluded to this at the beginning that uh, COVID has had an impact. It was, it was very tough for the care market, obviously, in the last two years. And I think it's afterwards when everybody starts to look back and reflect. I think people have said to us, um, they just felt like, they needed to leave it, it would you know they wanted to go um, and all of that does does give this ongoing negative perception that working in care is this very tough hard place but actually it's incredibly rewarding and people are incredibly passionate and it can be such a lovely place to work which is why we wanted to do something by showing the, the having the branding and trying to raise the all the good things we do in social care and and in the care market so home first, just to explain, slightly different model. So <clears throat> we've put it in here because um, they do similar work, but they're reablement workers. They are 
employed directly by the council on our own terms and conditions, but we've also had very challenging times with Home First as well. And um, we've got a lot of people have left Home First and um, most obvious one of prevalent reason has been retirement because we've had traditionally quite an aging workforce in Home First. Um, but we've worked very hard to increase the recruitment and that, that is paying off um, with the greatest uh, impact we're seeing in the West. So what are we doing to assist with recruitment and retention? So we're working on workforce development, particularly in-house, obviously with our home first. We're investing in the care market whenever we can. Um, and Becky mentioned again about the in year uplift, which I'll come on to. We are looking at the career skills and well-being. This is challenging, um, but we're, trying, we're linking up more with the um, integrated care system as well because it helps impact on us because we've all got similar workforces. Um, wanting to raise the profile of care and having different care delivery models. So I think Home First, we've done a lot with our HR advertising team, got some good stuff going out with films and social media, Facebook, um, and we've also tried to make our application process much slicker, much faster, so that we don't lose people um, by having a too bureaucratic a process. Financial investment, um, we've tried different things. So over the winter last year, we focused on retaining staff so we have we wanted to keep as many people in the care sector because we know some they leave um, and especially over the Christmas period we think it did have an effect it, it's very difficult to measure it but we reason we decided not to continue was, was because having talked to the care providers we all agreed it was just a very bureaucratic way of doing it and um, we've switched to recruitment incentive instead We've also introduced this, what we call an enhanced rural rate. So this is to help home care providers um, deliver care into our very rural parishes. So we pay um, a higher rate for, as an, an hourly rate there to compensate for their travel, um, petrol costs. Um, and then in the fair cost of care fund, that we got that as a council, 2.2 million. It could only be allocated to eligible providers, which were determined by the Department of Health and Social Care. So they went to, that went to care homes and it went to home care providers. You had to be registered with CQC. Um, that could have been very divisive for our care market because obviously other providers, such as those in supported housing, day services, extra care housing, are having the same cost pressures. So um, ACS agreed to put two million pound from its underspend to give an in-year uplift and all that money is going out um, in the next two weeks. So providers should get that um, for the winter period. So career skills, said there's lots of activity going on in this space. So we do commission an um, organization called Care Development East. They do a lot of third party training for us, um, for the care market and we've introduced so as I said, rather than do retention incentive, we've done a re recruitment incentive. Um, and we've had over 100 people so far join, and they have to come from outside of the care sector. So one of the things you'll see with the turnover is um, people tend to move within the care market. What we were trying to do is get people in from outside, from retail, and it has had some impact. And to get that bonus, you have to stay working with the care provider for 12 weeks and undergo the um, care certificate. SIAP, who are here today, um, are doing a number of initiatives for us. So for example, we give them grants to help to assist people with overseas recruitment, very expensive, um, getting yourself licensed. Um, and also we've got a leadership program which called My Home Life, which has been incredibly supportive for registered managers. Um, we've got other additional skills and training that we're doing with um, using European fund money that we mentioned more in detail in the report. We're doing a training hub for learning disabilities and autism because we've, you know, we've got more challenging behaviour coming through so we're trying to help the provider market lift the skill base. 
And um, lastly, on this one, we've got um, Integrated Care Academy um, that was set up with the University of Suffolk. So this is focusing on leadership and more integration in the future, which care providers will be able to access. Raising the profile of care, I think I've really covered this about the market campaign and how many uh, people have uh, looked at things that we've been doing. So we are getting some reach, but there's a lot more we could do in this. Care delivery models. So one of the things is we do have big contracts. We have a big contract for home care, but it, a, a contract can't deliver everywhere. And so what we're finding is it, those really rural areas, we need to think differently. And so what we're doing is working with an um, organisation called Community Catalyst to try and focus on really micro enterprises so people living in those villages that may have a few hours and would like to do personal care. Um, so we're trying different models and different approaches. Electric vehicles, you know, obviously that's the future, it's, but that impacts on the business model. So working with the care market to, well, how would this work? How could we support you to, to um, get more electric? And Becky mentioned the digital care partnership, which um, is got a lot of to offer. So summary, it is a challenge. Recruitment and retention has always been a challenge. It's just got worse. It's getting more critical. And these are all the partners that we work with. We can't do it on our own. We're part of an integrated care system. Absolutely, we have to listen to the care market and work with them. And we've got a number of other um, workforce development that we we're doing. So it's a very much a, a network of support that we draw on. Uh, I think that's me done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Prima, do you want to uh, make your comment at this stage? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I will echo a lot of the things that have already been mentioned, uh, but I think our exit from the EU did have a significant effect on staffing, and COVID compounded the issues. Um, for us, recruitment retention started to become a big problem uh, towards the end of 2021. And it's quite marked. I mean, I've, I've just done a profit and loss exercise within my own company, and I could see that in the last six months, the, uh, the company has halved its provision, and that's purely because of recruitment. Um, and the other thing is that since the culmination of furlough, carers have, have started to question the current method of care delivery, which impacts greatly on their work-life balance. And um, they, they are you know, asking those questions and wondering whether they can continue to work those on social hours. Uh, because you know, they've had a taste of what? Oh, sorry. A bit closer. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and provide a feedback based on exit um, interviews from leavers has indicated that the main reasons for exiting the sector are poor work-life balance because of unsocial working hours and unrealistic pay rates. And the particular bugbear in home care is travel time because we don't get paid for travel time and we can't pass that on. So I think the home care market is suffering especially because of the long travel time, the long working hours, and, uh, and the whole way that we work is not very conducive to a good family life. So the current issues, it's at an all-time low. Three providers told me that on average they were losing three members of staff and replacing with only two each month, thus increasing the shortfall. On some months, they did not receive any applications. Potential care st staff also do not want to undertake personal care. They've made that clear because when they come up for interview and we start describing the, the job, uh, the moment you mention personal care, they'll say, oh no, it's, this is not for me, and, and off they go. Um, they also do complain about the pay, uh, and they complain about the long hours. They complain about increased fuel prices, even though they may receive payment for miles. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons I've come with just a sheet of paper, which Matt kindly printed out for me, was because 
I was confronted this, with this very issue this morning. Two full-time workers saying that they want to leave because of uh, fuel prices. And uh, you know everything flew out of my head and I forgot my folder. <laughs> They uh, also do not want to work evenings and weekends, particularly, and they don't want to be constantly pestered on their days off to, to come and cover a shift you know, for sickness or whatever it is that, you know, that happens. Uh, they would like to see a clear and rewarding career pathway, but you, know, you, might, you could, you could, and we do, we promote them to, say, care coordinator positions or even higher. But when it comes down to the nitty-gritty, when people are off sick or they're leaving, the managers, deputy managers and coordinators all have to go out and do the work. So I think they're wondering, what is this career progression? It, it, it's, it's not there because what they're doing is exactly the same as they did before. The impact on care businesses is devastating because I've had reports from providers that their businesses were halved, and I've said the same has happened with me, three providers reported that they were on the brink of closing. Some of the desired actions I think we need to take to deal with the crisis are, you know, definitely the first and the biggest is financial investment to pay our staff realistic wages, and that's right across the care sector. Raising the profile of care, and I know that um, Claire has mentioned it, but in particular to bring it in par with their NHS counterparts, because that is an issue. And indeed, local authority um, staff, because terms and conditions are completely different. So where you might see Home First doing a lot better uh, in many ways, the same doesn't apply to the private sector, because they don't have access to the same pensions and sick pay and all the other things. And I think we have to bear that in mind. Having um, a clear pro uh, career progression, and I've mentioned that already, but, but which rewards good performance. Uh, exploring and implementing new care delivery models, and again, Claire's, uh, Claire's mentioned some of it. Uh, and I think the, the traditional way of going out there and looking after people uh, being there till 10 in the evening, it may not work anymore because our staff are not wanting to work those sorts of hours. So we might have, have to look at different ways of doing it, but at the same time staying within the requirements of the CARE Act. So, you know, like the Netherlands, maybe from eight to six in the morning or something like that. Um, and I think the um, introduction of technology is good and exciting. Uh, there are some hurdles because a lot of our clients do not have Wi-Fi connections and a lot of these uh, pieces of equipment need that. So again, there's some investment in that area. Uh, and I, this is a, a big one. Managing expect the expectations of our customers is very important because at the moment, um, despite the current conditions and concerns in the market generally, and the fact that we're having this recruitment crisis, their expectations are still very high. They're still wanting a five-star service. And they are wanting specific things like females only to care for them, or specific times that you know they want carers to come out um, to see them. And it's just not realistic anymore. We are able to recruit perhaps more males this time than females, uh, but we still have the problems within the community that they will not accept male carers, and yet they would do so in a hospital setting or an acute setting. So that, that's an, another area to uh, address, I mean, or concern. And uh, the, the final one is exploring the recruitment of um, carers from overseas, which we've, we've actually, we are doing it at the moment, we have researched it very well. I think you know, in Suffolk we're doing reasonably well. But there are um, hurdles there too you know, to overcome because, uh, again, it's how they're received by customers. But we also have a duty to prepare them very well before they go out to work in the communities. 
and uh, we have been doing it through our association, running training programs which cover cultural issues and um, driving skills and all those things you know that we take for granted. Uh, and, and we are continuing to do that with the help of um, Suffolk County Council. So we are actually working with the council to pilot several initiatives to increase staffing in the sector and to also uh, look at the workload and, and managing it well. Um, so, so yeah, th those are the things I have to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. It's very helpful. Uh, I think this stage, Michael, do you want to, obviously, I guess a lot of this falls on your shoulders, really, from a recruitment HR perspective. Is there anything you want to say at this point? I think probably just to underscore the kind of challenge in the market generally, <clears throat> if you take that 32% turnover in care roles, the national backdrop there is that's around, I think, 400,000 or so care roles nationally, 63% um, of which we will retain within the adult care sector. And this is probably a tighter time as any for losing the, re the residual to more competitive markets, retail probably being the biggest example. You know, if, if, if we're trying to hold on to more than that 63% of, of the workforce within adult care, we're up against re retailers now, supermarkets, for example, offering £10.50 plus an hour. Um, so that challenge of maintaining good levels of retention and just bringing in a few people to keep that retention rate, um, the, sorry, your turnover rate slimmer, is becoming tighter and tighter. Hence all the effort, really. You know, speak, I can speak, I can speak a, a, a fairly well about what we've been doing in Home First. And even given the, the, the terms and conditions that the County Council has at its fingertips, it still remains a very, very tight market and we have to work really hard and continue to continually evolve the, the approaches that we're taking to ensure that we're at the table too. So, you know, that kind of provides a little bit of backdrop about the challenge just, just beyond, beyond the, private, um, the private sector. Okay, thank you for that. So, uh, I think you've heard a summary. You've obviously got the information evidence in, in your pack of information. So, uh, I'm now going to open up to questions from the committee. And the first two hands go Councillor Chensey, Councillor Bird, and Councillor Robinson, and Councillor Scar. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. That was so interesting and enlightening. And I can relate to a few of those I've had to have care, home first especially, who have been absolutely brilliant. And uh, my stepdad, who sadly has passed away recently, had the most utmost beautiful care, which I'm really grateful for, because that's one thing you regret when they do pass away, is if they haven't had that care. So that's what I want to say, first of all, thank you to all of them. Um, but like any business, retention uh, costs less than recruitment. And I think we need to try different things to try and keep the people we've got. And I don't think this is any different from any other business. So I've got a couple of questions alongside that. What would the wage, this is a bit simplistic, but bear with me. What would the wages need to be in order for us to feel that we could retain at least those who move over to supermarkets, which I can't believe would fulfill them as much, anywhere near as much as the, the role they've got. And there's only so many supermarket vacancies that are available as well. So what, would, what do we feel as, as a minimum amount we would need in order to make neglect that particular reason? And secondly, on the um, recruiting side, the website, you mentioned something about 144,000 had seen the adverts. That doesn't seem a lot. Is that just on the website or is that all of social media? Because um, I would expect it to be hundreds of thousands if it's going to go across all the different platforms. So I didn't quite understand that. And then have we considered bonuses? We might not be able to increase their wages, but have we considered bonuses for those to retain them that do those out of hours, more difficult, cleaning up? personal care, you know, perhaps we can have them and, and say, all right, you don't do the personal care, but if you do do it, you'll, you'll get a bonus for doing it or whatever. I don't know, but it's just thinking creatively about ways to keep our current workforce, because this is crucial. 
I'll, I'll, start with, I'll start with the first one. So the first one around what would the wage need to be? Um, I actually recall, I think it was um, towards the end of last year when we actually calculated this. I remember Gavin was still around. And I think we'd calculated it as around 15 pounds an hour. But that was before inflation um, and cost of living in increased as it is now. So that was, that was based on our estimates that we would need at about 15, to pay 15 pounds an hour to be able to retain care workers. Um, and if we look locally, you only have to walk down any high street and have a look and see Aldi and so forth are uh, um, 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 recruiting and in some cases obviously it depends on the areas offering an average of 12 13 pounds an hour in some areas so we calculated that we probably need about 15 pounds an hour that was then I think we need to bear in mind that it's not just about the um, cost per hour that people are receiving is about the working conditions as well. So whilst, whilst you say that um, going to a supermarket is, not, is certainly not as fulfilling as, as carrying out a caring role, people could see it as a stress-free sort of op, op, um, option compared to working on the front line and caring for people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Currently, uh, it's costing us £15 an hour for our staff. Yes, that's what we're actually paying now. And um, I think we need to increase that. I, I, I think that in care homes, it's not so crucial because you don't have the, the pressures of fuel, etc. So that £15 an hour is probably fine. But I think in home care, we have the problems. and I. It's not even the hourly rate. I think if we paid them travel time, they would probably be happy with that. Did that answer all your questions? There's some more to come. Yes. There was the, the one about um, the website, I'd, but sorry, could you clarify? I wasn't sure. Yes, yes. Oh. Social media. Mainly on our views Facebook, on our website, yeah. Facebook. Facebook yeah. That Three seems thousand. low. I get eighty thousand on a tweet. <laughs> Make, yeah, I was say. <laughs> so, well, sorry, that, that's an important point, actually, isn't it? You know, what can members do to help and support? And if we have got Facebook. Twitter accounts, is that something we should be you know, promoting on there as well? Mm -hmm. So consider that perhaps. Yeah, sorry, do you want to... I think it's also the fact that when the word care comes up, they switch off. Um, because we use all, all the media, we use TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, everything. Because, you know, we need to. Uh, and I think the most popular is Facebook. So we get a lot through that. Um, yeah, um, and, and we've, we've used everything we can possibly think of, like, you know, shop windows and post office and you name it. Sometimes you have success with that, because if you, you put a, a more personal ad there saying, you know, we want to attract people who've retired and who can come and do a few hours, um, some of our providers have had some results with that. So it's a range of um, types of marketing if you like you know that we use and actually while i'm here i can also comment on the bonuses we do we do give them bonuses thank you, sir. Right, Bird. Thank you chairman um in in your presentation premier you, you mentioned the introduction of technology i'm i'm just a bit perplexed as to how that, that helps in terms of staff. Obviously, introduction of technology can be good for our customers because it can allow people to live longer, independent in their home. With you know, if it's fitted out with various gadgetry, and it's and it's good from the county councillor's point of view because it probably saves money. But the introduction of technology, while you can't stop technology being invented and discovered, 
the t introduction of technology in almost every field of employment leads to job losses. So I'm not quite sure how the introduction, I mean, our question today is obviously the, the, the problems of recruitment and retention of staff in the sector. So I'm not quite sure how introduction of technology is good for the, for the staff because it, it leads to job, job losses. I think um, we actually have soft, uh, nearly all providers have um, software that they use, you know, to manage their rotors and uh, records, etc. So in my particular case, I have a very good system where we can actually have, we have our daily records done, uh, you know, through technology. They all have their own smartphones and they pick up the apps. They can look at all the care plans in, in real time and they make their notes as they go along, which is a lot uh, better and time-saving compared to the old way when they used to have paper records and they had to keep all that up. Um, also, they, can, uh, they have a voice recognition thing, so they can speak into the, uh, into the phone and that will convert into, um, into actually written records. So it's more efficiencies, it's time-saving, and it gives them more face-to-face uh, -face time with the client rather than sta standing there and writing notes. So I think that is one good thing. And the other good thing is that we, it helps us to monitor our customers a lot better. So if our care is late and there's a query, so if we have a sensor or a video phone or whatever in that person's house, the office could ring in and say, actually, your care is on the, on the way, but are there any particular problems? And those are the ways that it can help us and our staff, I think. They found it good. Okay, so it's streamlining the administration, really, isn't it, more than anything else? Yeah, sorry, Michael, you want to go? Just building on one of the things that Prima talked about in her intro, too, one, one, one of the things that I think has been really important in Home First with regards to use of the technology has been the, the development of better rotary software absolutely supports the principle of um, holding down a, 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 a significant chunk of part-time workers in your workforce. You know, you don't have to have such significant administration that sits behind that to make it happen. Um, that, you know, in Home First, I think we're 26% we're full-time roles, a significant number of part-time roles. And certainly over the last, I think it's four or five years, Claire, you'll have to help me out with this, since we've had the, the software in place, that's been a big benefit, you know, enabling us, us to move a big crew of part-time staff around um, the model effectively uh, enables us to, to give people more of that work-life balance. That's certainly been a hook for us. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. I think it is an interesting point, isn't it? Because it is it's a balance, isn't it? Because care is a very sociable, sort of personal thing, isn't it? So you want the carers, I assume, to spend more time with the, with the patients, do you call them patients, or, or customers, or whatever? Uh, rather than doing admin and things like that. So I think it's... Uh, yeah. I think an important point in regards to digital care is that we, we haven't introduced digital care into our care plans to replace face-to-face -face care. It's a tool for our carers to use as part of the care plan. So it's, as I say, it complements face-to-face care. It doesn't replace face-to-face -face care. And, and I think um, so. It, it's, it's not a way of... Um, Topping people coming into the into the market, it, it just it, it's another tool to their care plan and their support that they can give residents. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. It's very important. Uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of quite simplistic questions, really. Um, some companies within this sector seem to do better than others with recruitment and um, retention. Uh, there's obviously a reason for this. Um, can't we learn from these companies that are doing quite well? And they must be doing something that the others are not. Uh, and I know of a couple of companies who aren't named, who've got a very good reputation with their staff, well looked after, they feel valued, and you know, they don't have such a big problem. And the other question is, what percentage, what's the correlation between the charges for healthcare and the costs in labour? Um, in other words, how much of the cake is the actual worker getting? Okay, so I think is there any best practice out there that we should be looking at, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah, go on, yeah, go 
I think when it comes to best practice, because there's over 500 businesses out there, they've all got quite different approaches, different models, um, and they do compete with each other as well. So for some, I think they are big organisations. Prima's mentioned as, as well that in a care home setting, you tend to retain your staff easier because you're part of a team, you're, um, it's a different work environment. Supported housing traditionally has been, um, we haven't seen quite so much of a turnover, but we are now um, because again, I think the wages are slipping behind. So it's very difficult for us as a council with that number of providers to know where the good practice is and to, to share that. And to be honest, mm -hmm. depends on the provider whether they would, they, they would tend to tell us what we, you know, they would tell us this is working. Um, you try and translate that to another provider and they'd say it won't work and a lot of them recruit very very locally So there's something about where they're located as well. Yeah. So it's a very complicated area. I have to say <laughs> Did you want to add anything Prima? Yes, I will actually having owned both nursing homes and um, Home care I can tell you that the profit margins in the nursing homes are a lot better particularly as you know in my case I was doing a, a very specialized uh, or running a specialized service and could afford to have a very good team with you know who who uh, were highly trained and i think um the same could be said for training up all the rest of the staff so you, you, i had a good team i didn't have that much, that kind of turnover however in home care it's a little bit different and, and it, i mean even then I think I have posts within the, uh, my home care which would not um, be the norm in uh, an ordinary in any other home care setting, and I think the the result is the quality, because that's the reason why we are an outstanding uh, home care service. But in order to run that, you know, costs us dearly because the profit margins in home care are not good. So you ask how much, and I'll say that we've been lucky actually to get about a, a pound an hour of, of profit based on what you know we're, we're, we're being paid and what we are paying our carers. And, and that's been dwindling over the years. Uh, you know, and, and um, one of the reasons for not being able to pay anything more than the actual 15 pounds that they're getting is that very reason. So uh, I think it varies. And the bigger groups or corporates, they have got um, more in the way of resources because it's all to do with volume. And the more that the, the, the clients they have, the more they can afford, afford to spread the resources so you, they can uh, offer the incentives and bonuses etc you know or better bonuses to their staff to keep them in place but i i'm hearing that all providers even the corporates are struggling at the moment because i've heard that nationally not not just in suffolk so um it does make a difference if you are just a purely private provider not relying on local authority funded customers i think it's a bit of a Ever increasing circle because your profit comes, as, as um, Prima says, from the volume of care you can provide. But if you haven't got the staff to provide that volume of care, then your profits are going to go down. So that's very difficult. But um, and that's why the majority of the the money that's paid goes towards staff costs and um, and and running running the business as you would expect for any sort of small to medium sized business that's a huge outlay for a lot of businesses is their is their staff costs um, but yeah so it, it's it's about the volume of work you can provide but if you haven't got the staff to provide that volume of work it, you're, you're constantly going around in a circle okay i was interested Claire, you said about sort of location and how impact that can have is there any evidence to say that recruitment is less traumatic in perhaps the high concentration towns and areas than it is probably in in others? Is 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 that an impact in terms of where where they're located? Where they're located? Yeah, 
we do have evidence of that. You can see from, um, like the, for instance, the waiting lists for home care, um, they, are, they struggle much more in those very rural areas, so um, places like down the Shotley Peninsula, sort of Saxmunda, I, that kind of area. And when you ask the providers, because you say, we've got the work, um, if you're running a business, you want the work. So the question is, why, why can't you do it? And the answer will be, we can't find people. And so, it, and because home care, as Pui was saying, you know, travel is a big issue. You don't want to travel too far when you're a home carer. You, you want to keep a run and you want to keep a network of, and so, you know, even going to the next village, especially in some of those more rural areas, it's like, no, I, I, they don't want to do it. So it does make a difference. And it's the same with the care homes. If they're located, some of them are in quite rural areas, they will struggle as well to find staff. OK, thank you. Um, I had, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, you answer your second question. No? Has your second question been answered? It was, it was just a, it was a point on, um, you know, what are some of the basic things that are being done well? <coughs> One of the things that you'll see, particularly with larger providers, will be they, in their recruitment media, they will start with their fantastic training and development opportunities. They want, they want to assure you that they'll give you what you need to be the best, most confident care practitioner that there is. And I think that across, not, not, just in, not just in home care roles, but social care elsewhere, um, that's a major factor, and, you'll, and Prima's point about economies of scale. If you're if you're a bigger setup, the the kind of corporate support that sits behind that, you know, your learning and development team, um, your practitioner supervision model, all of that sort of stuff is key. So, I think that th there'll be some variants of that. Certainly, from a from a home first perspective, um, we've got the opportunity to bring people in and give them a level two uh, apprenticeship to to get them on the first rung of the ladder in terms of care. And then, if you take that a step further. You know, if you if you if you want to look at kind of what, what the the increased standard looks like, therefore having a package of development once you've given people those core skills that enable you to, to increase your increase your development, increase your competence. You know, maybe give you the skills to move into another role. as something else that people will tend to major on too. You know, there is a there is a track here, and we'll back you on it. Basically, is the message that that will be that we'd be selling to the marketplace. Yep. As you say, through my working life. Um, I found one of the most important things has been for staff to feel valued rather than the money. They need to feel essential and feel like friends and really valued for what they do. And if they feel as if they've just been used as fodder, they're not going to hang about. Yeah, so recognition and reward, isn't it, I think? so. Uh, Mike, I think, because I have trouble seeing you some because you're behind Claire, so if you want to put, make a comment, just, yes, that's right, yes, just, just wave. <laughs> okay, Thank, thanks. Okay, right, so uh, moving on then, uh, Councillor Scarf. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, an, a, a number of questions. Um, I was interested in the presentation in terms of the vacancy rate in home first as opposed to the general sector because there's quite clearly a, a vast difference in that. Uh, and a question regarding that, are we actually seeing staff from the general sector move into home first? Is it more attractive for them to move into home first? So that might be a question uh, for Prima. Um, and then regarding the travelling time and fuel costs, I, I think I can perfectly understand why uh, carers are uh, really worried about fuel costs. And of course, part of that is uh, what you can pay as a mileage rate that's tax-free. Um, I think there is an issue there uh, in, in terms of the mileage rate uh, from central government does need to be re-looked at, even if it's only re-looked at for specific sectors where we have uh, a, 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 an issue. But what could we as a council do in terms of allocating the care in these geographically difficult areas um, better? You know, is, is there something we could do as a council to uh, specialise, if you like, in parachuting in a, a, a company or even an adaptation of home first? Um, and lastly, do we have any plans as a council? Uh, no, we're real interest what we've done so far, and I think that's really, really, really good. 
but what plans do we have as a council to sort of further incentivise people to actually come into the sector? Is there something that we're missing? Is there something that other authorities maybe have trialled and, and, and found successful? I'm really interested to see if there's further things that we can develop, because really it's today we're here about what can this council do in order to improve uh, the social care sector and incentivise uh, recruitment and retention. Thank you. Okay. So the first one, um, Home First is a competitor, if you like, for um, the care market. I think there, there is a few people that will move across, but Home First does a very different service. It, it has reablement support workers. And so the way they work is they go in, they'll work for up to six weeks with somebody, and then they'll move on. And that turnover doesn't suit everybody. Some people, the carers like to stay with a customer, and they may want to stay with them for five years, 10 years, you know. So the model for Home First is different. And so I do think it attracts different people, but they do move. Pick carers will move between uh, providers in the care market. So I'm sure there are some that come into Home First, but not as many as you would expect or think. Um, and then the second thing I was just gonna mention was that um, you talk about providers, you were saying about um, areas where it's difficult to get care. Is that, are you, sorry, oh, the travel. So the cost of travel, what we've tried to do as a council is we pay differential rates for home care. So we have five levels, and then we introduced an exceptional rural rate, which is um, up to £30 an hour. So we don't tell the providers um, how to use that money, because what we, if we were to pay an hourly rate and then put mileage on top, we would then get into the situation of, Every time the fuel goes up, it goes down. What does the council keep doing? So by having this hourly rate that different, so it goes down to parish level, we can flex that parish level, and we have done, and we say, right, if you're in a more rural area, you're getting a much higher amount per hour. It's up to you then, as a provider, to decide how you want to deal with the travel. So we try to stay one step back, if you like. Oh, and the other, yes, thank you. Yes. So the other thing we try and do is um, bit linked to the technology question. The council um, is introducing what we call geo-mapping. So we have big lists that go out with all the customers that are awaiting care. Um, but you can imagine, you get a big old spreadsheet come through. It's a little bit um, like wading through treacle at times. But what you find as a care provider, if you put it on a map, and you can also, by the provider signing up to it, we can plot where their existing customers are and who's waiting for care. So you can then, as a provider, see, oh, there's three people now in that village. I could offer to take the care for all of them. And that's making a difference because it's a nice visual tool. Can I just add? And adding on to how we can, um, how providers can help with particular areas where we are short of um, care providers. Well, we refer to in the um, presentation the community community catalyst scheme whereby providers can grow their own business from people within that community um, so therefore um, they are we're helping those people grow their businesses within communities where we are we know that we're short of care providers um, so and they're also people that know that community they know how it works um, and that's something that helps in those hard, harder to reach areas If I come back to you, I think that's really interesting, the geographical information, because that's something I wasn't aware of. So I think that's largely answered the questions. We, we, we appear to be doing as much as we can. Uh, and uh, I think the, the capitalist idea, obviously, is a fairly new one, isn't it? So it's proof of the pudding is in the eating. Maybe a year down the line, we might have much, much improved results. So I think that's good. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask, uh, are they making maximum use of the in review or the HM? RC mileage. Um, do they claim the difference? I think we had a discussion at our pre-meeting about whether you can claim the difference between what's uh, what's paid and what what the, what the rate is. We are using it. We're actually paying them 40 to 40p per mile. Um, but it, it is the the breaks in between that is the issue. That what they call travel time. 
So if they're going from client A to B, they might be solidly on the road from 7 to 11 in the morning. They then have a break, and then they go back at 12. So 12 to 2, another break. So it's all those little breaks that add up, because technically they are on the road from 7 in the morning to 10 at night, but they've got all these little breaks in between. And I think they feel that for all that time, they're actually doing only eight hours of contact time. So that, that's an issue, and they want to be paid in between too, which obviously is an issue. We can't afford that. Um, the, the extra rural rates that were mentioned are actually very good because they are the most representative of what the actual cost of care is at the moment. So they, they would be able to cover, or providers would be able to pay uh, a travel rate or travel allowance with that sort of money. But I think the issues are in the town areas where, you know, the thinking is that you know it's going to be compact and you'd be able, you wouldn't be travelling that much. But not so, not the case, especially in Ipswich, because of all the roadworks, the, the 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 problems that you encounter. You're sitting there idling, you know, at traffic lights, etc., and it just pushes up your your fuel bills and your time. And I, well, certainly for me personally, and I've heard from several providers saying the same thing, that the uh, staff from those areas, like particularly Ipswich, are the ones who are most disgruntled about those conditions. And it's always about travel time and fuel. And I think that's something that, you know, I've, I've spoken to um, the team here, you know, about, you know, that is, it's an issue that needs to be looked at because it's a fallacy to think that just because it's a town area, it's going to be easy. In Stowe Market and Felixstowe, there is not that much of an issue because it's a little bit more impact, uh, compact. I just wanted to come back on the, um, to Puma's right, you know, we have listened to the market about the um, town because I think, you know, we were very focused on the fact that the rural areas was where we were having issues with the waiting list. And so what we've done with the fair cost of care money that we're just about to distribute is we're increasing that level one, which is what we pay in those, um, in Ipswich, Lowestoft, um, by 8%. And then we're doing a much lower percentage. I think when you get up to level four or five, we're paying, uh, we're going up by 3%. So we're trying to address some of that balance because, you know, we do, as I say, we do try quite hard to listen to what the care market's telling us. I think I absolutely get the issue about the travel time. That is an industry issue. It's a national issue. It would cost a lot of money to do that. It doesn't make it right. It just is, Suffolk isn't, unusual in the way it's paying. I can well understand the traffic issue travelling to Ipswich. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a time I've come to Ipswich when there hasn't been some road work. So as you say, for, for, for carers to sit in traffic jams, for and there's more and more cars, isn't there, in the town centres, so that's a real, real problem. They have to get back on their bikes or something, I think, probably. So. <laughs> okay, I've got uh, Councillor Roach next, and then Councillor Flair. Thanks, Chair. I think we've skirted around some of the issues that I was going to ask because it's around workers being paid travel time. So the question is, what would it actually cost in the scheme of things if they were paid? So for, for most normal people, you go to work, you start work at 8 o'clock, you finish at 5 o'clock, you pay for that time. Some firms don't pay lunch breaks, but in general, when you start work, you're paid until you finish work, whereas care workers don't seem to be doing that. So the question question is, as the sum's been done, the, what would it cost if they were paid that? And then the other thing is, if we're paying companies that enhance rural rate, that actually isn't necessarily going to the people that are travelling, it's going to the companies for them to, to work it out. So I think we need to look at what, what would it cost if we did that, because that would make a huge difference to the amount of people that wanted to get into, into the job market because most of us want to be paid for the time that we're out of the house and that's just normal and this is one sector where it just doesn't happen if i if i start and it may be 
um, Prima might want to come in. Um, we don't know how much it would cost if we paid for travel time because um, it depends on so many variables. It's, it's actually really, really difficult. It, it, one, you don't know how long people would take to travel because as we've just rightfully said, one day a, a journey could take you 15 minutes, the next day it could take you 30 minutes, so things will vary. Um, it, it, it also depends on how the rotors are, are, are being rotated on that particular day because generally, you know, and Prima may answer this, um, people don't always use the same route every day. It depends on how many care staff they are on that day, what's happened, have any of your customers gone into hospital? therefore they don't need care. Things are constantly being rejigged and reshifted in terms of the rotors. So that's another complexity. Um, so no, we, we don't have that information, but I suspect it'd be quite difficult to get to a position with over, what, 500 providers to try to understand uh, for every single provider what that would look like, I incredibly difficult. Prima, do you want to add anything? Yeah, firstly, I have to clarify that this is not an issue for care homes or supported living, any of those places, because it's just going to one place and, and they are happier. And in fact, I, I will say that we have lost home care staff to care homes because they feel it's much better to go and work the care home, do a 12-hour shift, and then come home and the fuel costs are less, etc. So home care is, is very, very different. Um, and and I think you know, that there are so many challenges there. Now, if we were going to pay travel time, as Georgia says, it's very difficult to calculate, but you know, it would probably be, if we had a higher um, rate, which is closer to the ERR rate, and I think nationally they've worked out it's about 27 pounds per hour, um, that the, is the actual cost of delivering home care. So if we got something closer to that, we could then say, right, for your travel for a day, we can give you X amount. It wouldn't perhaps represent every single minute of tra travel time, but it'd be better. It, it, it's showing them, and coming back to, to your point earlier, you know, that we value what they do. That valuing is very important, and it, and it, it isn't always about money, I know, but money is important at the moment. Mm -hmm. So if we said, we take, you know, we accept that you are actually spending all that extra time, you're out of the house for long hours, so we are going to give you X amount to help you with your costs. And they will actually be grateful for that. And it's just telling them, you know, that we care about you and we are uh, trying to help. But you're, you're quite right, they do feel devalued, and these are some of the reasons why, because I think historically, um, the care sector has been taken advantage of. Um, they, there's an expectation that they will do it because they care. And that is how it's, it's been over the years. But of course now, you know, um, people are thinking there's a limit to how much I can, I can do, you know, that they're the going up above and beyond. There's a limit to that. And so, so they're, they're kicking back and quite rightly too. And I mean, current times, is not making it any easier for them. Okay, thank you. It's okay. Yeah. I think you could actually work out how long it takes to go to do each trip and then average it out. So, you know, that if spirits say we couldn't do it because there might be more traffic or they might choose a different route, you, can, you know that if you're going from A to B, that's a mileage and you know what an average time takes. So I think you could work it out, and I think saying it's too difficult <coughs> to do it is really an answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fleming. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, it's been really interesting hearing, you know, the inside story here. And, um, you know, with the money we've got at the moment, it doesn't seem, you know, that there is a magic wand to solve everything. But... Um, I do think addressing the, the travel time is so important. Um, what, is just, what is the expectation of contact hours per day for a care worker you know, w with a customer? About eight hours if they're doing full-time work. They would do, give eight hours of contact time per day. 
but actually be on the road from 7 in the morning to 10 at night, so it's about 11 hours. So they're doing about three hours extra. I mean, this is obviously very, very rough. But just to get an idea of, of more or less <clears throat> unpaid time a day, which does seem quite extraordinary, actually. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would... I feel that work needs to be done on that to take into account, you know, that, that time, that burden of time, which, as we've heard, detracts from home life and, um, and all the reasons why people don't want to remain in the sector. Um, another question, really, is there are so many contracts out there. You say around 500. And I, and I know that from previous work with the scrutiny committee, when we looked at um, you know, the procurement and contracting system at the county council. Is there a, um, <clears throat> a way to ensure that, for, for, for a start, all these contracts are consistent and are presenting um, an equivalent opportunity to all the participants? Um, are all of the different <clears throat> um, participants aware of, uh, you know, all of the possible benefits that they could um, take, such as the, you know, the additional travel or rural um, <clears throat> transport benefit. And um, I think, Becky, you mentioned the, co the community, a, a community scheme, which sounds, you know, really positive here. Are we really promoting all these additional um, benefits to everyone who's participating. So um, I was just going to say that we are trying to recognise the difficulties, particularly for home care. So in the cost of care money that we got, we um, the increase we've spent 60% in favour of home care as opposed to 40% for care homes. So we have tried to um, recognise that because we do understand the, the pressure home care is under. I think, um, yes, we can calculate travel time. And uh, as you say, we could do it in different ways. We could say, well, what if we lifted everybody up to £30 an hour? That's quite an easy calculation. And I think we're looking, we're looking at millions. So um, it's not going to be cheap, but we can have a go at that. Um, and the final thing, the community catalyst, um, that work has started from June. So they've um, just starting to really get out there now. Um, and they've already had quite a lot of interest. So that is being publicized um, and being spread about. And um, we've got a network of contract managers so they, they can um, get that message out as well to providers. Thank you. I, I just like a little more. Sorry, Becky, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, every provider has its own contract manager and that and the um, the reason they have a contract manager is to make them aware of obviously and I, and, I, and I, I will keep reiterating this we will not run their business for them they have their own businesses and they will take their business decisions according to their business models but we will make them aware of any schemes which we feel they will benefit from um, any grants available to them and give them that support in helping them enhance their offer um, and but, but we will not tell them how to run their business and, and how their business model should act. That's down to the business owner themselves. And also, in regards to the community catalysts, I can send you um, all the social media links you want, and you can, and you can um, please do forward them on and retweet and, and, and do what you need to do with them. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there is work to be done on the contracts, whether we could raise our expectations within them to, um, to try to, I mean, after all, it, you know, we're the contractor, we can, we can shape the contract more or less as we like, whether anyone takes it up or not is a different matter. But, um, you know, the ball is in our court here to, to shape our contracts in, in a way that's consistent and, and that works. We know that we have um, certain standards with regards to our contracts and, we, and um, the providers will 
um, have to have have to deliver a certain standard um, aligned with our contracts. But I'll keep going back. We cannot tell a person that the con the um, provider how to necessarily deliver that contract with regards to staff benefits. Um, so we, can't, we cannot, for example, um, say to you, you will pay the minimum wage to your staff. We cannot say that. That's their business. That's their business decision. That's their business model. That's how they, um, they will... I mean, we, we know the majority of our providers do pay above the minimum wage. We know that from, from, um, from our returns that we've had and talking to our providers, and I'm sure um, Prima will back that up. But uh, with regards to our contract, it's about the quality of care and how they deliver the care that we expect of them, not how they run their business. I think you'll find, uh, if, if you said this to me, uh, I would say about six years ago, yeah, there probably are, or would have been, some providers who would have um, kept a lot of the profits for themselves and not passed it on. But the, the, the time now is different, and uh, I think even providers are competing against each other. So they are passing everything on to their staff to make sure that they keep them. And that is the, the current picture at the moment. Is it relevant to this point? Because I've got others coming in want to come in. Okay. I'll come back to you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Mellon. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of three questions based on the, um, the reports we got. Um, uh, it mentions in there, and you've mentioned about the enhanced rural rates. Um, but it seems like the take-up of these has been patchy. It's been better in some areas than others. Do you have an explanation for that? And is there anything we could do to make sure it's sort of taken up more comprehensively across the, the county? The second question is um, mentions on page 23 of the bundle about the delivering skills and training, uh, and it makes mention of the European Social Fund. Is this something that we can still access now that we're out of the EU? And then lastly, um, I know this is not about care workers in general, but about the reablement re support workers. Um, we make the offer of flexible working there, but I just wonder how much scope there really is for flexible working within that, that sector. So those are the questions I had, thank you. Yeah, so the Enhanced rural rate, you're right, it works um, better in the West and uh, we've had much better take up, so we were curious as well. <laughs> um, and we think it's down to the fact that in the West um, we have fewer but bigger home care providers and as a consequence we think it was easier for them to understand and pick up on it and to expand and recruit, whereas in Ipswich and East, because of the rurality of it, there's a lot fewer providers, They're also, they tend to be a lot smaller, so even though they were aware of the rate, they still couldn't recruit and they still couldn't um, get that, yeah, to, so that was the, basically, that was the reason. It's the, it's the nature of the market, you know, we talk about the care market as, but it's not a homogenous thing, it varies very differently all across the county, so that's why it's really important with our contract staff being linked so closely um, to the providers that we get that direct feedback to understand, but that's the we think that's the main reason for the, the difference in take up. The um, European Social Fund um, is still running it, because of COVID, it got delayed, and the de um, so the money comes via the DWP, and um, it's been extended now, and it will finish in December 2023. Because you can imagine, you're trying to do lots of training, you've got lots of really good offers, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. There was no, providers just couldn't take it up. So the DWP listened to that, and uh, it's a joint initiative that we do with Norfolk as well. So it's over £7 million, pound, so that's still operating. And, uh, sorry, you were going to no, do that go one? <laughs> no, you go on. Go on. So the, the last one, the, you were talking about reablement support workers. In Home First, is that? Yeah. The flexibility. Oh, no, I can't answer that one. <laughs> Sorry. 
So, so, so yes, you are right, Councillor. Um, there is, um, you can be flexible, but there are obviously limitations in terms of flexibility because of um, the, the, the nature of the work, particularly in domiciliary care, where you need to be providing care to somebody at a particular point in time, whether it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and, and so forth. But uh, the potential in terms of flexible working is, um, as, as Claire's just mentioned, um, providers are all different they work in slightly different ways. So for instance, home first provide reablement, which is slightly different in terms of how that works. So maybe the flexibility of the role itself, rather than the actual um, 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 way in which it's delivered. There's also flexibility around technology, in terms of using technology, um, different models of care. So for instance, um, the geomapping, working in a more local area, uh, community catalysts possibly working with a different kind of co provider that's maybe more community focused than possibly a large national domiciliary care provider would be slightly different. So that's the flexibility that we're talking about, but by and large, the nature of the work you are right is such that you know people you know expect to be, you know to have uh, care delivered at a specific time because of the nature of the work. It's okay. Yeah. Actually, we are now so desperate for staff. We we are very flexible with them, so we are giving them different shifts. Um, some want to work only in the mornings. Some want to work in the evenings. But as long as they you know, contribute towards the weekend, every other weekend, uh, there is a lot of flexibility. And with the, the other point, the take up of the ERR rate, uh, the problem, if I just you know, could get you to understand, is that a lot of the providers that say in the Ipswich area, Ipswich and East, were already on, or their staff were already involved with. Uh, existing customers on the old rate, the level one rate, and you couldn't just come out of them. You just couldn't, you know, you can't just discard your clients and say, fine, we'll take all the new ones on the ERR. So that couldn't happen. So in terms of capacity, there was the capacity to move to picking up those, you know, in the rural rates. But whenever we got capacity, we did. But it's been such a slow trickle because of the numbers that we're recruiting, you know, which are almost nil. Um, and I think that's why there isn't the take up. But you know, if we had staff, the take up would have been great. Okay, yeah, great, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Mace. Uh, yeah, I've, I've just got uh, three things to, to query. Uh, the first is, uh, social marketing, digital marketing rather, in social media. Uh, the, uh, there are dangers and pitfalls that you can produce some quite nice social media, but you end up speaking to a, an echo chamber where the only people that see group pages where beyond just being on the Suffolk uh, jobs uh, uh, site, uh, because as I say, you can feel you're doing really good in your social media, but you're not actually reaching anybody new. So that's my first one. The second thing, uh, I was looking through some social media and uh, there were some comments about how the shift patterns changed, but didn't like it and thought, that's it, I'm going. Uh, so is there any opportunity to reward people who are inconvenienced with their shift patterns changing? People like consistency, they like knowing what they're going to be doing during the week and uh, rewarding them somehow for that inconvenience. Uh, is there any scope for that? And the third thing, uh, I'm a teacher most of the time during the week. Uh, I can't think of a time when uh, uh, care homes or uh, organizations have actually come in to schools and, and catching them young and m making it interesting. Uh, my daughter is third year paramedic. She, when she was 17, uh, worked in a care home for a year and a half. And the skills that she learned in terms of speaking to people with dementia and caring and cleaning and doing all the jobs meant as a paramedic she was miles ahead of all the other students. But the, the skills and attributes that you get as a, a young carer uh, lead on to pathways uh, with National Health Service or uh, 
nursing or pa paramedics. And I, and I think we need to make those links explicit for young people, but actually it can be really a, a nice way in to, uh, to other professions. And although there may be a turnover of young people, you'll be getting that young blood coming into the profession. And I just wondered if more work could be done catching uh, people earlier and having a, a, a... Because a lot of young people have got no idea what they want to be. And, uh, you know, the skills my daughter learned, I'd recommend for anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, you make some really good points. In terms of um, digital marketing and reaching out to community pages, um, I understand we do do that. Um, our colleagues in public health um, have a huge amount of links in terms of um, community pages uh, throughout the county, and we do do that. There's also quite a lot of work that happens through word of mouth, and I'm sure Prima will, 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 uh, um, will um, confirm that, um, where it's very much, you know, if you know a friend who works in care, sometimes you get a really good reputation a good reference to say, actually, um, Prima's looking for some carers, do you want to come and work, and so forth. And actually, that, that is quite a, a strong and reliable way of recruiting as well. Um, so yes, we are, but of course, there's always the potential for us to, 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 to reach out a little bit more and increase that uh, much more, but I think you do make a good point. Prima, do you want to add on to that before I move on to the next one? Sorry, can I, can I add on to that? Yes, of course, um, <laughs> So George, right work with public health with regards to um, sharing their posts within their community groups which um, has proved successful and this started during the COVID times when we were when we were um, trying to share as much information um, as possible um, but also I think um, what we um, are doing is trying to make the most of career fairs for example um, for um, in colleges and such or um, any business fairs um, but we don't. You don't often um, get up, get. Um, you don't often see a social care um, stand recruit recruiting. So I think that's something that we are trying to get more involved with. Other businesses are represented, but not necessarily social care. So that's something that we we think we could do. But I think you're right. Um, we could work more with our school network um, with regards to um, going in and just chatting to people like you do have policemen going don't you and talk about being a police a police person not a police um so to speak but um you, you go in and talk about that so i think that's something that we can certainly do but also um what we've tried to do in our social media campaign is that we have the coffee and care chat as well which is talk people in the profession talking about the profession there and why they're in it and how they love it and you can't get a better, as, as George says, a better recommendation for going into a vocation than word of mouth and for someone that's already in that vocation. And they've had a, they've had a lot of views, and it's everyone from different walks of life with regards to social care, so they do work. Okay, I think, Michael, you want to come in? Then I'll bring Priya. On, on the kind of more local marketing, um, that's something that, from a Home First perspective, over the last six months or so, we've really recognised a shift in. We did a review of our media campaign, I think it was late spring, um, and we used to take an approach that was throw quite a lot of money at a general marketing strategy that covers the whole county, and, and that had had some limited success, but we've, we've completely shifted focus now, and we are, we're looking at, you know, geographical Facebook campaigns in our geographical areas and although that is slightly more expensive the return on that is far far better so I, th I think you know it, at scale we're seeing that that geographical focus really really works um, the other thing that's probably worth referencing is that and, and you guys might have to chip in on this because you may may know more than me but we, we create some film content for home first that I think has been shared with the wider care market um, that sets the scene of a young lad talking to his class about the work that his father does. Um, so we're, we're trying to promote kind of connections between younger people, schooling, the market, what it means to be a hero, to be a carer. Um, so they're, they're things that we're really working hard on. I think I, I completely agree that kind of more tailored local approach that speaks to the next generation of people that are going to be coming into the sector is, is, is vital. You know, where we're talking about growing our own being a a really big part of this. We've, we've got to work hard at that. There's just some examples of um, where we've had some success. Where do you want to come? Yeah. Just to come back on two points that you, you raised. Um, rewarding staff who work extra and who work um, 
you know, where their rotors are changed. We do actually. We were actually active in the schools a long for a long time. It's dropped back recently because of the pandemic and the fact that you know it was all hands on deck and still is. Every member of the team is out there, you know, carrying out visits. So we don't have the manpower. But it's something that the association is going to, to take up and run with. So we, we have eye care ambassadors who actually go out to the schools and who give um, little talks, making it very uh, demonstrative. You know, they'll take a whole uh, pack of things with them and show them dressings and all sorts of other things. And that has been quite successful, it's worked. We've actually had applications from young people as a result and have taken them on. Uh, and uh, uh, just to endorse what Georgia said, word of mouth is actually so important. And although you can have social media and uh, you know advertising uh, online and so on, um, we find that we get quite a, a high percentage of our staff applications through word of mouth. So that's quite powerful. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to add, Councillor Mason, is um, whatever we do in Suffolk, um, as much as we are um, trying very much to be innovative, my view is all we're doing is we're just tinkering around the edges. What we really need is something that happens nationally, um, that's actually driven centrally. Because if we look, for instance, at young people, um, there's not a great deal of prestige in care work. So, you know, paramedic or care worker, you know, if people had an op an op a choice between the two, you know, particularly with young people nowadays, where it very much it's about how you're perceived, you know, um, uh, social media and, and so forth. You do have people come into the profession, but certainly not as much as they used to. So I think there is something that we need to, needs to happen, certainly from central government, in terms of just lifting up. Um, in terms of uh, whether it's a career progression, it's funding, so that it becomes a profession that people look at and feel valued and actually aspire to work in rather than a, a profession where it almost feels as though it's a stopgap or it's something that you do when you're at a certain point in your life or a certain stage mm -hmm. in your life. And that's what we want, that actually people, while they're at school, actually go, I want to go into care and actually I'll start off here and this is where I'll end up. Thank you. If I could just come back on that. Uh, but, uh, on the uh, government uh, website, uh, apprenticeships, level two and level three, are very clearly options and pathways for young people. Yeah. Uh, and, well, I'll be honest, I don't see much promotion of that. And I just wondered if, we could, if, if there could be more of a promotion and highlighting and make it, try and make it more prestigious. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I've just a point about apprenticeships. Thank you. Thank you. There's an old phrase, George, I think at least you've probably heard before about you're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And I yeah. think that's, that's the point you're making, isn't it? And uh, I think there is uh, needs to be a game changer, really, somewhere, doesn't there, nationally? Uh, otherwise, I can just see the whole care market, you know, just falling apart. Because I think you said, Becky, it's fairly fragile. Um, and how fragile, well, we don't quite know. But uh, it seems to me it's pretty teetering on the edge. So there needs to be something done major, I think, at national level as well. Perhaps that's a recommendation we can consider as well. It's a culture change, isn't it, for people, yes. how they perceive Absolute. social care. Absolutely. So yeah. that's a, that's a, that takes a while to change, yeah. but we can we can try and do what we can. But I think Councillor Mason's point about if the cultural change starts very early, doesn't it? And if you can get in there very early with young people as well, it helps. Okay, I've got two. I've got Councillor Chensey next. Yeah. Um, just to come back on that last one, because, you know, I worked at Suffolk New College. Uh, Becky and apprenticeships was my responsibility and we had the care industry in a lot and they had stands and we talked about about it but it's right it's about the branding it's about that making it look good I have to say some of the social media that I've seen is very boring it's just text it needs pictures of carers looking happy doing their job I mean one of the ones that came to look after my stepdad she was really young she was like 21 and she said I just love looking after old people I just love it and it was just she was just so sweet and my stepdad loved her and you know if you see pictures of this this just gets it's the emotion so I think there's a lot that can be done but then that leads to my question about 
I think what government can do is help us to promote this abroad because even though we left the EU, where there's a skills gap, we can have people come into those jobs. They will legally be able to come to this country to fill jobs where we've got gaps. And I think we need to do a big project um, with the EU, well, with Europe, not EU. We don't just want those, we want all of Europe. Um, so that's my question, what have we done about that so far? But I think that could be the government uh, mantra. They need to help do, do that. And the second thing is there's something about being out in the villages and something creative and innovative about tapping into the community. So that, pe I mean, there were people that were helping with my stepdad that lived near him. If there was some way of remunerating them for popping in, doing certain things so the carers don't have to go out so often, so perhaps some sort of creative, it will take a while, but just tap into the community and say, would you like to look after someone in your village? And, and they just get paid you know, a, a smaller amount, but we, there's a lot of people who volunteer for absolutely nothing. So I know people would volunteer and perhaps have some expenses paid a little bit on top. Um, and then save that travel for, for that person. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, something a bit off the, off the wall and a bit different. Okay, thank you. We probably need to clone your, uh, your young person, if we could clone her. Oh, into... <laughs> We'd do well. Who was Don's? Uh, can I, just on your last point, um, Nadia, that's exactly what the Community Catalyst is about. Um, it's, it's about um, working on the support network within a community, building on that at different levels, um, to, in order to provide care within that community. They know the community the best. They can build up on, they can build their business via that community catalyst. So that's exact, so it's not a off the wall idea at all. That's totally the right way. And that's, that's what care's about, isn't it? It's about drawing on your support network around you. And, and that's exactly the, the ethics behind, yes. I think we can, we can arrange to do um, a, perhaps a briefing for people in regards to, um, um, in regards to community catalysts, yes. And if I could just add in relation to um, recruitment, um, as you mentioned. Um, um, so I think from the government's perspective, they, if they, they would probably say they've put in place a number of things recently. Um, so they've now recognized uh, the skills shortage in social care. Um, there are visas now available um, for providers to be able to recruit abroad. However, there are still problems mm -hmm. with that because actually I think they made, initially made a commitment that um, they would be able to fast track visas within a matter of I think three weeks, two to three weeks, but you know, Prima could probably give more detail, but that hasn't translated. So I think for providers who are still trying to recruit abroad, it's a huge bureaucratic nightmare, um, very expensive, um, and at the end of it, um, possibly not as, you possibly might not get as much reward as you, in terms of what you've actually put into it in terms of cost, but Prima, maybe you could add to that. Yes, I will indeed, because I'm caught in the process at the moment. It, it's roughly about four to 5,000 pounds per person that you bring over. And um, getting, getting approval for your application for a certificate of sponsorship is running into 10 weeks and a lot can happen in 10 weeks. You know, your business could, could go, that, well, go under in that time. But having said that, getting, the, getting these staff over is not the, the answer, really. It's not the, the fix that you think, the quick fix that you think it could be, because there are lots of hurdles to overcome even then. And I sort of briefly mentioned earlier, you know, about um, training them, you know, it's cultural awareness. Um, and it's right down to basics, from basics like slang, you know, what, what are the things you need to look for when the, your client is asking you for this, they really mean that. Um, don't take it literally. So we've developed a, a whole set of training um, sessions through the association just to support providers who've got staff from overseas and um, then the driving is an issue if it's home care because um, some of them will come with driving licenses and they are allowed an international license for a year and it's they're diabolical because two of them have trashed my cars i mean they're right off so see so you do there are all these things i mean it's a learning process so obviously i've learned from that and so have a lot of other providers and i'm sure It'll get more streamlined as time goes by. But those 
those mem members of staff that you take from abroad have got the same feelings and the same issues that our staff now have. So if you, you know, you can't treat them like slaves. <laughs> you know, you've got to, to, to um, offer them the same employment um, conditions and uh, they will soon be realizing that the cost of living is high and that there's their fuel implications and all sorts of things. So we're kind of back to square one. The only thing I would say with overseas staff is that they are kind of tied to you for a five year period. Having said that, they can move if they want, if they could find another employer, another sponsor. But generally, they will stay with you for at least four years. So you've got that continuity. Thank you. <coughs> this might be controversial, but I can't understand why you recruit abroad when there's so much unemployment in this country. But I'll probably leave that there, I think. Uh, Still a, lot, still a lot of people out of work. Um, David, did you want to come back? Oh, you can, okay, so it's Councillor Bird then. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to um, go back to, I think it was a response to um, Councillor Fleming's questions on contact hours uh, of a care worker in a day. Did I understand, you, Premier, you gave an answer saying that on, on a shift a member of staff might be away from home from 7 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And that's correct. You see, to me, we've spent approaching two hours trying to get to the nub of the issue of problems of rec retention and recruitment of care staff. To me, that's the nub of the problem. Mm -hmm. I've been sitting here trying to contemplate how, ma how many pounds per hour I'd want to be paid to be out of the house from 7 o'clock in, in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, albeit there might be some rest time. I'm also contemplating how many different things you can do sat in a car in a lay-by. You, you can't have a social life. You, you can't catch up. I mean, if you're single like me, when do you find any time to do washing and ironing, gardening? That's if you can afford a house with a garden on, on those wages. How, how, when do you watch television? When do you socialise with your family and friends? I mean, to me, it seems absolutely absurd that you're expecting an employee to do a working shift, albeit some of it is re relaxation and rest time, from seven in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. No wonder you have a problem recruiting and retaining staff. I would also question, I mean, this has been asked in the, in the past in terms of health staff and doctors when they used to do ridiculously long shifts. How good is the quality of care that somebody provides at half past nine at night when their day started at seven o'clock in the morning? Also, given that these people drive, how safe is somebody to be on the road driving at half past nine at night when they started driving at seven o'clock in the morning? So this is the nub of the problem. How on earth do you recruit and retain staff when you're expecting them to do a 15 hour day away from home. I'm assuming that's not five days a week, is it? No, no, it's not five days a week. Um, it's, it's about maybe four, but again, it depends on the person. If they want to work those hours and they want to work five days, then they will work five days. But I absolutely agree with you, that is the nub of the problem. But can I clarify, it's only for home care. It's not for care homes and sheltered housing and all the other areas where there's also a recruitment issue there. But our biggest problem in the country and indeed in Suffolk is home care. And we can't manage to get people out of hospitals back to their homes because we don't have home carers. And I think that travel time is the biggest issue um, for them because they feel they, they feel used. Well, fair enough, you know, there are break times where, you know, most, most times you don't get paid a break. But it, this exceeds their break time. And uh, I, I, I can perfectly understand their, their moans and groans and them coming up and saying we are leaving because of that. What I, would, I would do the same, you know, if it were me. So, yes, it is an issue. I'm just going to come, come back. I appreciate, obviously, we're talking about 
home carers and not those that work in a, a care home, but there's things called shifts. You know, a, a factory that's open from seven in the morning till 10 at night will have an early shift and a late shift. It won't expect the same staff who were there at 10 o'clock at night to have been the same ones who, who were there at seven o'clock in the morning. You know, as I say, I'm single. If I were to get a job like that, when, when would I do washing and ironing, shopping, cleaning, and socialising with my friends if you're expecting me to be out of the house from seven o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night? I, I find it absolutely absurd, and, and that's why you're going to, I mean, whether you pay £10 an hour, £15 an hour, £50 an hour, that's not, the pay isn't the issue when, when you haven't got enough time, I mean, that only allows enough time to sleep. I don't, presumably, you, they have them rest time so they might be able to eat their meal, but I'll come back to the point, there's only so much you can do in a car and a lay-by. I don't really call that time away from work. I think it's a fair point, and it's like uh, hospitality, isn't it? I mean, they do split shifts often, don't they? An early shift and then a late shift, perhaps, as well. So, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. Yes, I, I just wanted to um, I, I wanted to um, emphasize, Councillor Bird, that not everybody works those sh th those hours. There are some people who work those hours. There's the flexibility that we talked about. Different employers will have different arrangements, um, and there are shift patterns. You know, early shifts, middle shifts, late shifts. Some staff may decide actually I want to work all the way through and do a long day and so forth. Um, as as, as Councillor Ladd has pointed out, hospitality, uh, you know, NHS sometimes on the wards and so forth. And I know. It's a different environment, but you know, staff still have the ability to choose what works for them in terms of their lifestyle. So it's not mandatory that people have to work um, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. We do offer them shifts, but if they want uh, to work 30 hours a week or 37 and a half, you can't fit those. You can't fit those hours in within those shifts because the shifts are shorter. So it's a, a morning shift was only about four hours, and then the, the afternoon lunch time is only two hours and so on. So, so it's hard to give them what they want, but within that shift time. And that's, that's the problem. Um, but we're trying, we're trying to work around it to see what we can do for them. But it still comes back to the same thing, you know, it's back to their travel time. It doesn't okay. matter, even if you give them shifts, they still want to be paid travel time. Thank you. So I think what you said, Georgia, is that nobody is being forced to do those hours. It's really their choice if they want to do those long hours or if they want different shifts. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yes. Last one, I think. And then we'll yeah. Just on that point, um, if someone wants or needs, actually, to work full time, they more or less have to work say um, 50 hours to um, achieve a 37 hour week for instance it, it, as a practical matter and that that is not the same in, in, in most other professions I think um, it's not the same in nursing I mean there's an assumption that it will take you up to an hour maybe to get to work but that's sort of up to you um, but I think this is a highly unusual situation and something we clearly, I think, need to give a lot more thought to how we solve. It's not that unusual, actually. It's been going on in home care for years. That's exactly how we've worked. It's never, never changed. Um, but you're quite right, in, in, nurse, in hospitals and in care homes, it's different because they have identified shifts and uh, you know they just work a shift they choose to work three shifts three shifts a, a, a week is the norm in a care home and they're long shifts they're 12 hour shifts but that's what they've chosen to do because they'll then get four days off and you can see why people working in home care are now moving to the care home sector because it works better for their their work-life balance I just wanted to, to, to say, it, it's, as Prima says, this has been happening for a while. It doesn't make it okay. Um, it's something we are obviously very concerned about, and indeed any 
um, local authority or NHS trust are concerned about. But I suppose it's about care in the community, isn't it? You know, if people are in the community and they require care, people will require care to support them to wake up in the morning, which tends to be quite early. Nobody's, generally for older people, they don't want to still be in bed at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning. They want to wake up, have a bath, have their breakfast. Then they want to have lunch, as we all do, at a particular time. Then they will need support in the evening at a particular time for dinner and to go to bed. And that does make it quite restrictive in terms of that's what people need and we have always said we want to adopt a personalized approach to people's needs. Um, and, and so, so th um, I, I know that um, certainly district nursing services are having similar issues because district nurses have um, the same issues similar to care workers, obviously not paid in, in the same way, but similar to care workers as in they need to start seeing their patients in the community at home very early on. They will work solidly through the day. They will have downtime you know, for, for a break in between. But I certainly know midwives and district nurses saying they are still doing visits quite late at night and again this feeds into the, the, the shortage of staff because there's not enough staff so therefore people are working longer hours but I suppose I just wanted to emphasize to say uh, uh, this is the problem in terms of care in the community which is a good thing for us to be able to support people at home but it's quite difficult to be able to effectively manage it. Sorry, just, just to add to that as well, um, it's the nature of the caring role in that um, also um, people don't want to see lots of different carers throughout the day so if they have an allocated care worker to them and um, then that that person might get them out of bed at seven o'clock in the morning might give them lunch and put them to bed so therefore in its nature of being a, in a caring role it's a 24 7 job job role and and we don't what we don't and and this is feedback and we know that what's good for the people that we're providing care for is that they don't have a constant rotor of different carers coming through because it's all about building relationship and trust with that person who's providing that care for you so it's a nature of the role and which you know you have to be that's why we call it a vocation as opposed to a, um, a, a as necessary career choice for some people because it is it's about that support and care that you're giving to that individual person. Yeah. It's not it's an not, easy job. It's not just a job. No, you're right. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I think that's pretty good uh, summing up, really, of that. So I think we've uh, had some good questions. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex, not one size fits all topic. Um, I think clearly there's a lot of good work going on. Uh, I can applaud you for that. Um, I think what we're trying to do is see if there's any gaps in that. Is there anything that we can... And I think some of that has come out through discussion today. So it's always helpful, I think, to have these discussions, isn't it, from, to get feedback from yourselves as well, um, because I think there's two or three points we can probably make recommendations on. So before we go into recommendations, um, I'm very happy that if you want to have a 10-minute comfort break. Uh, and uh, thank you all very com for coming this morning. If you do want to stay for the recommendation, you're very welcome to, but uh, we understand that you've got very pressing jobs to do anyway. So, but thank you all for your contribution this morning. It's been very, very useful, I think, to understand a bit more about uh, what happens in the marketplace. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll say 10 past, back at 10 past if we can, because um, we've got a bit more to do before we can have lunch. Thank you.
Okay. <clears throat> right? We'll uh, crack on. We've got a little bit more to do, so we've got some recommendations to come out of that. Hopefully you found that was interesting. I certainly did. Uh, learned, learned quite a lot this morning about various things. <coughs> uh, just to remind you, we are still being recorded, so yes, Councillor Bird. Well, it doesn't come as any surprise what I'm going to recommend, Chairman. I mean, we keep being told we don't control these companies. So in some respects, it's difficult for us to make recommendations because this is what the council can do and obviously we're told we don't have direct control over these um, companies so I'm going to suggest that we write to the relevant minister lobbying to um, for legislation to restrict the hours that, that care workers I mean we can we can talk from now till next week about paying them more per hour and, and valuing them more but it's you know we wouldn't we wouldn't allow HGV drivers to be on the road those amount of hours, but we're expecting it's no good talking about <coughs> only counting their 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 working hours and their contact hours. It's how many hours they're out of the home and how many hours the full length of their working day and and the fact that they're driving on the roads those amount of hours. So we I think we need a, a, a letter to a relevant minister asking for legislation to restrict the maximum work shift, work pattern, however you want to frame it, that, that care workers have to do. Thank you. <coughs> I'm just wondering, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of hands going up. Uh, sh should we just go through the recommendations that we sort of wrote down during that first? And that might cover some of the points. <coughs> excuse me. If it doesn't cover the points, obviously you can, you can come in to do that. But I just think that might, because we're a bit pushed for time. Uh, obviously, it goes without saying that we thank the witnesses for their attending and, and for the good work that they're doing already. Um, there was something around uh, encouraging members to do a bit more in, in perhaps on social media and, and promoting care work through their own channels uh, and around vacancies as well. Um, I think consider how much it would cost to introduce a mechanism which would enable providers to pay a rate which would compensate staff uh, for the average three to four unpaid hours uh, carers spend travelling each day. There was quite a lot around, I think, that travelling thing, wasn't there? And uh, we might need to sort of perhaps expand on that a little bit as well. Uh, continue to work with young people. I think your point, Joe, about, you know, getting, getting them young, uh, having those links with uh, schools and colleges uh, and career fairs, I think probably more could be done there. Uh, because when you go to somewhere like Suffolk Show, you see the police, you see the fire, you see all the sort of care, all the, all the stands there. Uh, I've never seen a care stand, so that would be quite good. Um, promote apprenticeships in social care. That's around, I think, improving the image or making it more of a career than just a, a job. Um, more information so we're asking for an IB about the information bulletin about the community capitalist scheme I think uh, Nadia you, you you raised I think a bit more information about that we'd all like to hear about that I think yeah uh, managing customer expectations a bit customer expected to be able to dictate when carers come in recommendation around travel times you know I wrote something down uh, about uh, um, travel to review mileage rates and travel times. I think there's a whole piece of work around there that probably could, could be done. Uh, and then I wrote down what, what Stuart's just said, a letter to the minister, whoever that may be at this moment in time, <coughs> but a letter to the minister around exactly those points that you made, because it is a national issue. It's not just a, um, a local issue. It's a, it's a big national issue as well. Okay, so those are the things that have gone. So we've got a couple of hands. Um, so we'll, we'll start this end and go all the way down, should we? So, so Joe, if you want to go first. Uh, yeah, uh, the first point was about uh, the law of uh, unintended consequences. Uh, there may be somebody who looks at their week and uh, only wants to do a three-day week because they've got other things that they need to do on other days of the week. And they may choose to front load their week by thinking, well, I'm, I'm happy to do, to, to do a long shift. And uh, I'm just nervous that we take away people's freedoms to choose how, how, how they would wish to work if we over-regulate in that particular aspect. 
it's just unintended consequences. So we need to be careful of what. So what, how, how can we put that into recommendation, or are you just saying that's a No, it was just in, in response to the, uh, the amount of working hours that people right. are limited to. It's quite clear that the care homes have uh, shift patterns. Yeah. yeah. And indeed, the same with home first. Uh, but if you take away uh, the right of a worker for, for, of a freedom to choose yeah. to arrange their week as they would like to, yeah. then uh, that could be unfortunate. So it's around the flexibility of working patterns, isn't it, really, I think? Which, yeah. Which, yeah, okay. I think you should be looking at weekly total hours as opposed yeah. to yeah. Uh, individual days. Yeah, okay. Right. Yes? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, yes, and also... Uh, uh, some. Oh, you've got yours on, just some, some people, I mean, I, I had a friend who did it for many, many years, and she would go home in between each client and do things like housework or prepare the dinner. Not all of them are travelling in between each client, so we have, we have to be careful, and, and I don't... I agree with you, we shouldn't over-regulate. Mine is back to the social media. I really feel a recommendation to improve the quality of that social media yeah, yeah. and improve the adverts. Yeah. It needs some yeah. good pictures. It needs someone to look it over. Uh, and come up with a good marketing plan. And also the other thing is there's a job, there's a career, and then there's a vocation. Mm. And I think caring needs to be seen as a vocation because very special people go into caring. Yeah. We, we can't all do that job. No, right. So I don't think it's a career, I think yeah. it's a vocation. And yeah. I, the language needs Absolutely. to change yeah. so that young people feel that it's worthwhile, that they'll love it, and that they're valued. It's a bit like nursing, isn't it? That's a, yes. That's a vocation. You've got to be a particular kind of person to do that type of role, I think. Yes, yeah. and they are special okay. people. Okay, thank you. Stuart, have you got anything to add, or you, you said you were your bit? Well, I mean, one compromise could be that led to, to the minister asking that, obviously, <coughs> that uh, uh, any limit would be a limit that of ours that they're forced to work, so then there would still be that flexibility that Councillor Mason has picked up in yeah. those who choose yeah. to. I'm still concerned even if someone chooses to do it, that whether it's really safe and advisable to have that length of working day. But Okay, thank you. David, you... Um, a question I would ask is on that £30 an hour <coughs> um, rate that they're paying for the enhanced rural. How effective is that? Who's and who's actually getting that rate? It's going to the companies, but is that trickling down to those workers that are in extended rural areas that are doing the travelling? So I would like to see perhaps a little bit of analysis and detail on where that money goes. So we could ask that, uh, yeah. ask that for a bit more detail on that one. Yeah, okay. Eddie, you... Yes, just very quickly. I think I'd agree with the point that Nadia made. I think in the first comment that was made this morning, that retention is preferable to recruitment. I mean, obviously, um, as far as care providers are concerned, there is a significant cost to recruiting staff in terms of training, uh, applying for sort of DBS clearance and things like that, courses, um, and possibly if they paid them a little bit more in terms of a, 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 a basic hourly rate, um, you know, they, they would avoid these additional costs of further recruitment, and actually the net, there would be a net benefit there in terms of cost savings. You never break that circle, do you? Because you actually you 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 you're spending a lot of money recruiting, um, and if they're leaving, if the churn is so mm. great, you're just putting money in all the time, aren't you? Yeah. So as I said at the pre-meeting, it's like a bucket of water. You got a hole in the yeah. bottom, and you put stuff in the top. It's just running out, isn't it? Yeah. So that's right. That's right. But also, of course, um, there is a problem for providers in terms of them having to actually front that initial cost of recruiting and training a member of staff. Before that, before that stuff is actually sent out and starts actually earning money for the company. And then, of course, there's a further delay between the staff being paid for the hours that they've worked um, and the money then coming back from, um, from social services. Okay, right, yeah. Keith, you got anything to add? Yeah, a couple of things I was thinking have already been said. But I think one of the keys is to change the perceived social status of the care workers. I think they need to feel more important in their work and more valued um, and this is, I mean they did it for nurses but they went too far with making them college graduates but that was why they did that, to improve their social status and the way they felt about their job we need to do that to a certain extent with um, social care Yeah, okay, thank you Nathan, you go 
Uh, well, I sort of agree with um, Steve and Nardi here. It's like, um, like you said about the uh, sort of if people doing multiple shifts, like some people doing almost 60 hour shifts. Like uh, I come from a family of nurses, and some of them, you know, they do, they're working sort of 12 hour shifts five days, you know, a week. And that's on a good wage, um, much higher than, you know, than uh, the care workers are. And so we, I think, um, and so their lower wage and their hours, I understand why they're burning out, because it's happening on nurses' levels, that's much higher level. And we're seeing sort of, well, there's no social life there. You know, there's no, you're, you're sleeping, you're working, you're sleeping, mm. there's almost nothing there. But, like I agree with Nadia, um, you can't be limiting like these shifts, because these people, they sometimes need these, you know, this amount of money and need these amount of shifts to survive. Mm. So I think, um, like Groove Steve about sending the letter, but maybe yeah, adding in some parameters about, you know, about the sort of the forced hours and all that. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Jessica? Thank you. Um, so a couple of things. I, I have real concerns about <clears throat> staff who want or need to work full time and earn a full time wage. Um, <clears throat> because uh, my guess is that you should be able to earn a full-time salary if, if you want to in a, in a certain profession. It seems that this one is particularly difficult to, mm. to do so because of the disjointed inherent nature of, of the service provided, which I think we all recognize, and um, because of the, you know, the travel hours complication. And, uh, you know, I... I think, you know, th this clearly needs to be addressed so that people aren't <clears throat> working horrific hours, thus making the enjoyment of the job, um, the enjoyment level is, you know, is, is very low and, and so people don't stay. It's, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think we need to get to grips with that. Um, I don't think we have all the answers here today, um, <clears throat> but um, I, I personally feel that it might, I'm just throwing this out, maybe a workshop to discuss this more um, involving, you know, the actual, <clears throat> you know, the service more directly to try to understand, you know, how that, you know, might be made to work better. I also have some doubts um, about whether the contract or the contracts that we um, are tendering for this service are really doing the best job they can. Um, I don't know how many, whether we've used a standard contract, which clearly would need to be modified somewhat to account for the vastly different sizes of provider that are out there. I mean, with you know, four or 500 providers, um, you know, that's, that's a lot to manage. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> when we had the task and finish group on procurement and contracting in the past, you know, it was very clear that, that it's an awful lot to manage effectively. And um, things like, you know, are the extra um, payment for sort of rural or, <clears throat> um, you know, difficult travel times, are those really being passed on to, to the, to the um, providers of the service? Um, if it's not mandated in the contract, then, you know, my feeling is it, that and other things may not be, despite what was said today. Um, I, I think the contractual process and our, our, our capacity to control it, actually, it, uh, are, are still, to me, in doubt. What would we be recommending around the contract saying, because I, I wrote that down as well, and I, I, like you, think a contract is agreement between one person and another person, so there's got to be some negotiation, hasn't there? But, uh, and I know Becky kept saying we can't dictate to businesses, which I understand, but in a contract you can put, I guess, almost anything, because they have to work to the contract, but they have to agree it, don't they? So I'm just wondering how we can put that in a sort of recommendation. Well, I, I, my, my feeling is that, and I, and I have in the past worked a lot with contracts, <clears throat> you can shape the contract, yeah. you know, a lot according to what what you as the, no. you know, contracting no. entity no. want no. delivered. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, the person entering into the contract, it's up to them to work around yeah. that. So I, I, I don't know whether there is more scope for <clears throat> maybe consistency and maybe <clears throat> um, expectation 
uh, that would possibly make it less tempting for people to have to move you know, between one contractor and the next if they want a promotion, that kind of thing. It, it, it seems like it's a bit chaotic and wasteful. And, and, and the contracting process should be more streamlined and consistent. I think there is a piece of work around the contract, I agree, but as I said a minute ago, the other person has to agree the contract. And if the contract is too stiff or too, too one-sided, they ain't going to agree it. So you ain't going to get care providers actually agreeing the contract. But, but I do think there is some more work to do around contracts. And perhaps we yeah, can work I, word it around, around that. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And, you know, we're not party to the whole daily um, sort of <clears throat> friction that goes on mm. in that area. Mm. Mm. And, but I suspect that there is a lot that could be done to improve yeah. that. Okay. Great, thank you. Andy. Yeah, um, I, I thought it was very interesting this morning, a um, really good set of witnesses we had, but there seemed to be sort of two sides to it to me. There was um, uh, Georgia and, 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 and Becky uh, and Claire sort of bigging up the fact that the Suffolk is doing well, we're at the top of the rankings, that sort of thing. And, and then Prima was much more the kind of breath of fresh air, this mm -hmm. is what it's really like to be an operator and to try and provide this service. Uh, and, and was was much less positive, I felt. And, and, and at the heart of it seems to be this issue of, of the travel time, you know. So people are working, they're providing care, um, and as part of that work, they've got to travel between different sites and they're not paid to do that, uh, which is a manifest unfairness to me. But I don't know quite what we can do about it, but that's the way the system works. Um, you know, they may get a mileage rate, they may get an enhanced mileage rate, but they're not being paid for that travel time. Mm. Maybe your, your letter to, to a minister, you know, might have some impact, but it, it's clearly a, a kind of national problem. Mm. Um, and, and, and no amount of, of social media and bigging up the profession is going to deal with that, mm. to my mind. Mm. Sorry. No, I, I think you're right. And, and what pulled that out was, I mean, was saying that there's obviously quite a lot of people leaving the... Uh, <clears throat> you know, a sort of travelling bit to go into the uh, to, to the care homes, isn't it? Because you have you've really got to travel twice a day there and back. You haven't got to sort of go all the way around and go through all the traffic and all the expense and the time that that occurs. So I think there is something around travel times. We, we had something around travel, didn't we? About completely reviewing mileage rates and travel times and all that aspect as well. I'll come back to you in a minute, Keith. Is, is that relevant to this? Or is that relevant to this yeah. bit? Okay, yeah. Just to say that I think we've got to be careful about travel time. As somebody else has said, it, that it could quite easily be that a carer has gone to somebody at lunchtime, 12 o'clock, had spent half an hour or whatever they spent with them, and their next appointment might be a, a mile away at 4 o'clock to so help somebody with the team. Now, you can't count all that in travel time. Mm. Mm. Um, it's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Um, your travel time, I think, has got to be based on distance rather than the time, because a lot of it is downtime between appointments rather than travelling. Yeah. I think you're right. I think what we've highlighted is there's an issue around the travel time. Yeah. So if we highlight that and say, you know, we, we have some concerns about the travel time, uh, and can they can they review that? I mean, obviously, what is? Yes, they did. Yeah. 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 And and I think that's a good point there. It's about actually travelling, not how long you, you've got, because you could go home and do other things. So yeah. I think we need to make make it specific. It's actually travel time yeah. we need to calculate. And we will get asked for a, a review um, in six months, won't we, of, of some of these things, so to see what work they've done in terms yeah. of that. So, yeah. Okay. I'm afraid you're last, uh, Keith. <laughs> That's right, I don't, I don't mind being last. We'll leave um, the best till last, you see. I, I'm sure I won't have the last word on it anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought a fascinating presentation. Uh, and like Andy, I thought Prima was very honest with us about the problems that exist in the industry. And she's had, obviously, considerable experience in the industry. Um, I'm not a great believer, I must admit, in writing to a government minister asking for something to be done because... We've all seen the letters that come back, and they're very much, you know. But I'd, if we're going to do it, one of the things I think we ought to recognise is the fact that the HMRC mileage rate has not changed for a significant period of time. And I know that as a self-employed person. 
Um, and I think there is an argument that that, that that does need to be looked at. And in particular, I think it needs to be looked at from the kind of mileage that uh, social care workers actually do. And I can understand why they're concerned about the, the, the cost of fill, because it goes up, it goes down. But overall, that 45p doesn't really cover the actual cost of running a vehicle. And it's an added worry to them because they're doing that mileage. So I think perhaps if we're going to lobby at all, we will to lobby on that. Um, I like the support for the training uh, package to bring people into the care industry. And I think there's perhaps some more work that we can do in conjunction with Suffolk College and so on. Uh, in, in terms of that aspect, to relieve perhaps some of the actual costs to uh, a, a care provider. Uh, Prima said uh, that if, if they sort of bring someone in and they train someone, they're probably likely to stay there for four years. Well, I think that's pretty good because the average turnover in most industries now is a couple of years and I'm going somewhere else, I'm going to get a better job, I'm going to be promoted. If you talk to young people, they don't stop in the same industry necessarily, or certainly not in the same job for a very long period of time. Um, the point about workers having to uh, do long hours, I think we, we, we've gone into uh, in, in some considerable way, but of course some of them may have to do those hours in order to actually live, so they may actually be increasing their hours and their numbers of shifts, and I don't think we really got to the bottom of that. Is it because they want to do it? Is it because they have to do it and therefore they are working those long hours. I, I really don't think we got the answer on that one so I think the idea of actually talking to people who actually uh, work in the industry uh, uh, through an informal workshop is an extremely good one because I think you get an even better understanding of what's really going on. Um, we heard about you know we can't tell companies how to run their individual businesses and I think I would largely agree with that but I do think that we could perhaps do more as a council to work with those companies to to show best practice, to show what's what's available. You can't micromanage a business, but I think from the contractual point of view, uh, Jessica's absolutely right with that. We can tailor the contracts, we can give advice, we can do a lot more, because after all, it's our responsibility as a council to provide these services, and we choose to provide them through independent companies. We've made that choice, and that's not going to change. Um, but I can't help thinking um, that at the end of the day, if we had have taken the social care precept that we didn't take, we would have had 3.6 million or 3.7 million, and we could have used that money, if nothing else, other to set incentivise recruitment and retention in the industry. So I think there's a salutary lesson there for us as members, all, all of us as members, that had we used that resource, we might have been in a slightly better position now or going forward. So I think. In the future, if we have that opportunity, I think we've really got to consider using that opportunity for those extra funds to, to, to bring about the kinds of changes that we've talked about, the innovation, the incentivisation that we've heard that goes on going on within ACS and working with the industry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think if you do do something with a social care precept, you've almost got to target it, haven't you, into recruitment, retention, rather than just putting it into a big pot which might get used elsewhere. So, okay, that's pretty good. I think uh, we've got quite a lot down there. We will try and put them, I mean some were recommendations, some weren't, but we'll try and pull them all together if you like and then send them around to you uh, in the next couple of days so you can have a look at them, see whether they fit with what, you, what you're saying. But I think we've got the real gist of, uh, gist of the recommendations there. Could, could we have a chance to look at the letter? I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about what message we want to send to a minister. And I think maybe we all need to think about that a little bit another have a think when it comes round. Yeah. I mean, I take on board all of the points that have been made, and yes, both here and in, in my capacity, district council scrutiny, and I've read too many replies from ministers, which is along the lines of we note your comments and, and nothing more. But to me, we've got no other choice because we, we, we can talk from now till next week about how we negotiate contracts. We've been told we've got 500 companies. It's not realistic to go back to each one of them and say, well, look, if you want to continue your contract with us, we'd like you to treat your workers better or reduce the hours they work. That's doing it on an ad hoc basis. Unless the legislative regime within which they work is changed, then, and also we could end up 
cutting our nose off to spite our face. If we, I'm not going to say belligerent, that's the wrong word, but if we dogmatically say, oh, well, you'll only have a contract with us if, if this, 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 and this, we could end up not getting enough contracts to yeah. provide the amount of care that we need yeah. to provide. So it, that's why it's got to be done at national level and in, in legislation, because then that takes the issue. Yeah. It's not us to have to sort of try and negotiate with each of these 500 providers. It, the, the legislative framework would be there within which they have to work if they want to be a provider. So mm. I, I see, I see no, yeah, I see no choice than to write the, I, I mean, all right, the, le, the, the relevant minister can choose to just send us a holding reply back saying we know your comments, but if, if every county council wrote to the minister saying change the framework, they might then listen, you know? Yeah, I, I'm fascinated. I don't think it's a bad thing to write to ministers, actually, because uh, you know they won't know if we don't tell them. Um, and even if they just send back saying your, your comments are noted, at least that is noted. And I, and I think in the past, <laughs> in the past, I, th I, I think we have had some impact on that because you know, as I say, at the end of the day, ministers, if, if, if they don't know, you know, we've got to tell them what the issues are. So I think they're always helpful. Those. So we'll try and word something which is appropriate. Can I say? Yeah. All right, Catherine, got, got enough there. Quite a lot there, actually, isn't there? I think yeah, so. Yeah, great. <laughs> Masses, yes. Okay, that's great. Um, we'll move on then, if we can. Item seven on the agenda is uh, information bulletin, and you've, you have them there on the care strategy on page 27. Uh, one on care homes, capacity and placements. One on the implementation of the new mental health social work service. You've got the uh, corporate performance summary, quarter four. You've got a response from the uh, now uh, former Deputy Prime Minister um, from the Department of Work and Pension. Well, she actually didn't write it. I don't think it was written by uh, Baroness somebody, wasn't it? But uh, at least we did get a response to it. Um, and then we've got uh, the carbon budget net zero by 2030 progress information bulletin. So. If you've had a chance to read those, anything in there which you want to point out at this stage? Yes, David. I don't know whether it's sort of relevant to this or the next one, but with carbon budget and, and all of that that's coming up, um, and we did discuss it on Monday, that perhaps we could do a workshop on, on climate for the carbon budget and the, where the PDP was and what's happened with it. And I think that a workshop might be a useful way of, of bringing that back. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I've certainly found the last two workshops we've done very informative, and I think they have helped us when we've actually come to scrutinise the topic, because we have a little bit more background information, don't we? So, um, so yes, I mean, the carbon budget is a new thing. We're looking at on the 9th of January, but uh, um, I think it would be very helpful to have a, a couple of our workshop on that as well, um, so that we have a bit more background, because it is a very, very new, new thing for us to be looking at. So, yeah, thanks for that. We'll try and build that in. I think we were talking about sometime end of November or something. Yeah, maybe after the date. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll find a date, David. Yeah, thanks for that. Anything else on information bulletins? No? Okay. We're then going to, uh, I think, move on to item uh, eight, which is the key uh, decision forward plan and forward work program. Uh, our next meeting is on the 24th November. We're looking at bus services. That's a pretty broad subject as we stand, but uh, we'll try and scope that out. Um, I think, again, fairly topical with what's been happening in the, in the local news over the last couple of weeks. Uh, now, 5th of January, we're doing, um, as we did last year, a budget training session. So we get somebody in from the uh, um, public scrutiny who can sort of steer us through uh, what we should be scrutinising on, on the budget. Again, I thought that was very helpful last year. We're having a different guy this year just to make it a little bit different, but that'll be on the 5th of Jan. As I said at our pre-meeting, that's going to be a busy week because the 5th of Jan, I think, is on the Friday. So just after New Year, that's going to be a busy week. But if you can, that'll be online. So if you can attend that, I think that'll be very helpful because he will go through the 
budget papers with us to give us some pointers of what we should be picking out. Now, you may ask, well, I know already what we're going to pick out on that, but I think it's very helpful to have an external person um, guide us through that. Um, and the 9th of January, as I mentioned earlier, is a carbon budget. Okay, so we said on Monday, and I think a couple of you um, volunteered, on the 3rd of November, we'll be looking at uh, how we scope that particular meeting. So, uh, and I think Councillor Mellon has, has offered to attend, and uh, if anyone else would like to attend that. It's, scopings are normally done just by myself and the Vice Chairman with the officers, but uh, because the carbon budget, as I said, is a very new topic for us, um, if any of the committee want to join us on the scoping, we'd be very, very welcome on that. We know where your uh, priorities lie, then, Keith. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fine. I mean, we, we don't want the whole committee, but if, we, if there's a couple of I mean, if it's just Councillor Mellon, that's fine. Um, but if there's anyone else, obviously let Catherine know uh, on the 3rd of November. Again, that will be online. Um, and then the 10th of Jan, after the carbon budget, we'll be looking at the financial budget. Um, and I will <coughs> suggest to you that this is probably a, the most, most day. It's a, it's probably all day, or most of the day, so be, be prepared. <laughs> Claim on expenses, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so be prepared. That might be m the best part of the day, okay? So are you all reasonably happy with that programme? Um, 9th of March, we're looking at... Oh, sorry, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering why there's not a date. I think that's quite an important one to be looking at. I, I thought you'd come to the end of this thing, so I was just no. saying, <coughs> no, I'd I mean, like a date for that one. I think that's an important... Okay. Well, I think we're required to have the, almost a sort of six-month forward programme, so we, we obviously try and put topics in there. So okay. um, 9th of March, we've got equality, diversity and inclusion, which, you know, again, is a very broad subject. Um, and on the second... May, we're looking at the uh, fire service action plan because they've just had their inspection. So there's no point in us looking at their inspection. I think we want to look at their action plan, their progress on their action plan as against the inspection. Um, so if we can fit that one in, I don't know whether we can. Because it's not programmed at the moment, is it? No. Okay, if we haven't got a date probably in the first six months of next year, but... I think it's about getting the timing right for that one, isn't it, and, and where that sits. Probably want to do that before we get into budget settings, yeah. I guess, but we suppose in the point. But, um, Maybe we should talk to um, Lou. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll talk to finance. We'll talk to Lou from finance to see where we can fit the best time to fit that, fit that, fit in, that in, yeah. in the process. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. It should but give enough time for any ideas yes. before that budget. Before, before the yeah. budget setting, yeah. We've missed, missed obviously this for next year, haven't we? But probably sometime next year. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and the other thing we, we sort of thought about was uh, something around our partnership with developers. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, but I'm sure you are. There's five sites around Suffolk where there's going to be a joint venture housing with Lovell's developers. Um, and it's about uh, delivering homes for life. <coughs> and I don't know whether the, uh, the districts are doing that, and I think we did discuss on Monday whether we write to all the district planning cabinet members, because it's more of a strategic um, planning exercise about what they're doing in terms of homes for life. Um, because certainly from what I've seen, developers are not very keen to do homes for life because it's more expensive to, to, to create them. Yeah, so like you said, yeah, yes, yes, because you're cabinet member, at, yeah. yeah, so. Planning, planning and what have you has got to be down to the district, hasn't it? So that's where the negotiation is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think <coughs> the point, because I, I sit on the joint venture board, the point I keep making is that actually if the county council don't get this right, 
you can't expect others to because we're going to be held up, you know, actually ridiculed and criticised if we don't actually get those housing developments right. You're right, the county council are only providing the land, but again, they've got quite a lot of influence over the developer to say, actually, we, this is what we want. You know, now whether the developer will do that or not, I mean, it's a very similar but scenario, isn't it? Point. It's a very similar scenario, isn't it? Is, is that, you know, we can't tell them how they run their business, but actually, what influence can we have to say, if we're giving you the land, we expect those houses to be built to the standards that we, we, we would want. Uh, otherwise, you know, we, we would get called over the coals, and quite rightly, we're not doing that. So. Okay, so we'll leave that until we get them. When is the white paper due, Dave? Jim? Where are you? <laughs> Last year. Yes, um, okay. Yeah. Say one no more. Yeah. yeah, watch this space. Okay. Okay, happy with the forward work programme? Yeah, as we stand. Yes? Uh, are we going to have um, highways coming back to us at all or not? And we did say we would. Yes. Um, um, and and the other thing is, if we do, <coughs> Um, can we have an effective scrutiny meeting in public would be a question I'd want to ask. A and should we be looking at it at that level? I, I, I don't know the answers. I'm not saying I do. No, I'm just I'm putting, putting it out there. We're in the trouble of negotiating new, negotiating new um, contracts, aren't we? Yes. Well, we, we, we looked at the procurement process, if you remember, didn't we? Yeah. Um, but we did say we'd like to see highways when it comes back. I mean, I think we can't have much more involvement in the procurement process because we'd look at that. And a lot of that is, has been commercially sensitive, hasn't it? But um, we did say we'd like to see that when it's, when it's done. Uh, maybe we'd like to see what, what, looking back at the recommendations we made when we looked at procurement, are, are these being carried yep. out into yep. the actual yep. tendering process? Yep. Yep. And you know, determination of... Well, we could have an information bulletin on that to start with, if you like, of saying, you know, have the record... I mean, obviously, we have this process now where six months after our scrutiny meeting, we will send the recommendations to the Cabinet member saying, has this been done, have these been done, and why haven't they been done? So so we'll do that, obviously, with procurement. So, so that's a starting point, isn't it? And then we can pick it up from there and see if we need to look at it in a bit more detail. But I think the procurement... The procurement process has happened, or happening, isn't it? So we probably can't do much about that. But did it happen the way we recommended it? I think is the point, isn't it? Yes, that, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I don't think we can, because no, yeah. it's commercial yeah. sensitive. Yeah. But certainly afterwards, once the contract is awarded, we can then, when it's in the public domain, we yeah. can then look at it and say, was this done, was that done, and did you follow what we, we said or not? So I think there is something there to look at on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was February. February, yes. Yeah. So we'll be asking for that. Well, no, we could do it now. No, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I'm just going to say, particularly on that point, I mean, it's of interest to all county council members because we need to get it right. Yes. So I, I don't really have a problem with having a meeting in private, yeah. but I think it should be available and, and known to all members that we're going to have that meeting because I think we really do need to get this right this time round. Yeah. Uh, it's in the interest of all members. So there was a lot of interest about the highways contract yeah. uh, and not just members of the scrutiny committee. So I, I, why, can't, why can't we have, uh, why can't we have a, a, a scrutiny meeting which, you know, we can make it exempt to the public, it's perfectly reasonable to make it exempt to the public and then members can have an open discussion with officers and portfolio holder and, and, and learn from it. Can, can we do that? Can we? Our meetings had to be in public, have they not? Well, scrutiny can go into part two, or the other way to do it is to just do it informally. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, let's think about that one. <laughs> I, think, I think as soon as the contract is public, we're okay, really. We can then scrutinise it till the cows come home. Well, thanks to. Yeah. Well, it will be. That's probably too late now, to be honest. perfectly legitimate when we're talking about contractual issues or staff names or anything such as that and I normally I wouldn't like to hold things in in, in, in camera but no. that's a perfectly sensible we way get, forward. We get coups of secret meetings don't we which is not great. Really. Well yes but I mean they're, 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 they're really sensitive issues aren't they and they could affect the, could affect the contractor and 
and someone might say something inadvertent. So it kind of has to be in private. But I think the essential thing would be that the offer is available to all members of the council to come and join the committee that day when we look at that particular issue. Because, you know, we're only a representative and there's a great deal of interest by members in the, you know, procurement and provision of highways going forward because clearly we need to get it right in the future. I mean, I would have thought they would be uh, to all members, you yeah. know, but as you say, that's the, once the contract is awarded and in public, you know, I don't know where we are at the moment in terms of what stage. Are we in the process of just actually awarding the contract or are we still in negotiations with, um, with the providers? I don't know, really. So. I do take your point. I don't totally disagree, but you could say that about any subject, yeah, really. Yeah. I don't know that we're going to have much involvement in changing the procurement process. It's about did the procurement process, when it's when the contract's awarded, did that follow yes. our process that we recommended or not? And you're quite right, it's too late then to do anything about it, but I would suggest we probably won't have much input to do anything well, about it I was going to say that, we won't have any, no one's going to go, oh, no, sorry, we're not going to do that now, because no. scrutiny's just no. looked at it, you know. I, it's, I, I but it is to check for future. I think we can look back and see, has it has followed it be? what we yeah. recommended? If not, why not? And we could make some strong recommendations you've around got, You've got to trust so. people to do their job and learn from previous lessons, so. Up to a point, yeah. Up to a point, yeah. 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 I think as a practical matter, it's probably too late to have a proper scrutiny of and, and expect any changes to be made and you know I'd, I'm happy to do it <clears throat> you know at a time that where it's helpful to highways actually and to the council but and there are probably nuances in terms of how the contract is actually implemented that we can influence as a scrutiny committee after the award which yes. I understand um, you know the they're interviewing you know, as we, well, the last week or two, they've been interviewing the final um, contenders, so I, I would expect, um, you know, that the award will be fairly soon. Well, the contract is, is, is to be renewed uh, uh, October 23, isn't it? So, um, but I think you're right. It's, it's, I'm sure we'll have highways on our forward work program for the next five years, I suspect, bearing in mind what, what we've had in the past five years, but uh, uh, if they've learned anything, it should be better than the last one, shouldn't it? But we hope they will. So, Okay, all right, thank you for that discussion, it's very helpful. Um, I think that's probably the end of today's meeting, thank you very much. 24th November is the next time, we shall all gather together. Thank you. <laughs>